All right, so I'm here today with Sherry and Luke and Jess, and we've decided that we're going to tackle having a conversation on um, the recent, a conversation about a conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, we're gonna do a little analysis of the um, recent conversation that Jordan Peterson had with um, Ian McGilchrist. Um, and uh, we're gonna play some clips from that, and then we're going to, um, to talk about that. And I've kind of like given everyone permission to just sort of like start, start talking if they have something to say and I will pause the, the clip when they start talking. Um, so uh, is there anything anyone wants to say as sort of like sort of an interview or introduction before I drop into the first clip? So a couple things. Okay. We can't wait for Paul to do a commentary on this because we'll be waiting too long. So we'll just do it ourselves, Paul. <laughs> and also um, you can do a commentary on our commentary that's right, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and then um we all i don't know everybody he did a commentary on stephen fry which i thought was good the jordan pierce and stephen fry conversation but we all i think we all probably thought and nate i know you explicitly have said this a couple of times and i mean and i think this too that the mcgilchrist conversation is more important because really I mean, I think what yes. is saying in and the it, master and the emissary is like, and is it may have on? some, it may have something to do with blackbirds, and I may mention it later. Ooh, <laughs> it's 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 what McGilchrist is saying is really maybe like the most concise, clear, propositional uh, work that could help the modern world with what's wrong with our consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think to be, I would say if I were to give a summary of what McGilchrist is doing, McGilchrist has found a way to talk about spirit that materialists can understand. Mm. Yes, yeah. And, and Jordan yeah. Peterson is kind of a bridge there because Jordan Peterson is, Jordan Peterson also, my wife said this the other day and I thought it was a good insight. He's able to talk about science in a very modernist scientific way, but in a way that transcends the science. And so these, so these people in McGilchrist terms who have kind of a lopsided left brain are still able to, to just peer into what Jordan Peterson is saying. But ultimately Jordan Peterson, ultimately Jordan Peterson is truly what I would call a mystic because he, he acknowledges and submits to the transcendent. He I think that's to what he doesn't yet see and understand. Yeah, I think that comes through more in his uh, in his newer book than uh, his previous book, particularly in chapter eight, which my, I might want to discuss at some point. I, I think that's like the best chapter in his new book um, because he starts to he's thinking about beauty. And this is like. It's kind of like culturally, we become so obs obsessed with the idea of objective truth that we have lost touch with, with beauty and how beauty is also like connected to truth. Um, and that it's this pursuit of truth with a loss of the importance of beauty and goodness yeah. that has kind of caused our breakdown because it's just this, it's only this left brain rational idea of truth that we're valuing, which isn't really the whole, that's not the whole of truth and the whole of truth involves the connection of truth, beauty, and goodness together. And I right. think, and, you know, I mean, the language that um, McGilchrist is, is framing it in is um, language that is, I would say accessible to, um, to rationalists but it's it's using language that's accessible to ration rationalists to point beyond rationalism, I would say. Right, which, okay. is, my, which is my favorite thing. So I, one last thing, <laughs> damn it, then we'll get started. So <laughs> this is why, like everything you just said, I think, I think everybody's familiar and I quote it all the time, but Dostoevsky is beauty will save the world. That's why, that's why he said that is because he realized, I think in this post enlightenment coming burgeoning modernist world that we are now just as ubiquitous everywhere in the consciousness this objectivist kind of pursuit of truth 
Dostoevsky just saw that on the very front end. And, and so he, he realized that beauty would be our gateway to, to a fuller, what I would call a more noetic, complete man vision. Because I, and I try to say stuff like that sometimes. Like I say, because people will say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so I say evidence and facts are in the eye of the beholder. And people just look at me <laughs> like I'm an asshole. <laughs> But I think it's what I'm trying to do is get at kind of poetic diction. And I'm trying to use somewhat, I don't know, destabilizing language that just makes that just makes people look at me askew because I, I don't think that that's untrue what I'm saying, but I think it hits a modernist. It hits their ears in a way that is uh, discordant. Right, right. McDonald right. calls McDonald calls poetry truth in beauty. Yeah, I think uh, I have in my in my notes. I don't know if I'll get around to do it, but but poetic diction is one of the at some point is like one of the things that uh, um, I want to talk about in relation to one of the clips. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go ahead and get. Let's go ahead and get into the first clip here. And everybody, let me know if you can hear okay. One of the things I was re Is everybody able to hear? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. I'll, I'll go ahead and play. And if someone has something to say, just go ahead and interrupt and I'll pause. Reading the introduction to your new book this morning. And I was struck by many different topics, but I was particularly interested in your conception of attention. And so you talk about attention as something that in some sense brings things into being. I don't think that's a misreading of your of your of your writing and maybe I could get you to expound on that a bit and to tell me what you think attention is because I've had a hell of a time differentiating it mm. from well from fluid intelligence for example or from consciousness or mm. like it's a word mm. that makes sense when you hear it in the context of a bunch of other words but when you extract it out from that context and try to grip it it falls apart in your grasp so I think one could say that attention is the way in which the individual disposes his or her attention. It's, it's a disposition of one's consciousness. So attention is how you dispose your consciousness towards the world. And I, when I discovered, when I was researching The Master and His Emissary, the, the book that's now 10 years old, I came across this fascinating thing that one of the most fundamental differences between the hemispheres is their way of attending. And it didn't entirely hit me at the time how important it is. But uh, we can talk about that uh, later, but you were asking the rather sort of interesting philosophical question about how attention helps to bring things into being. And I think it does both generally and rather particular in a very particular sense in the left hemisphere generally what i mean is that how you attend to the world depends you know on that depends what world you find the qualities of the world that comes to your attention is determined by the quality of the attention you bring to it and so that, that's that, a very significant that's a very significant statement I was talking to someone the other day who's somewhat theologically minded, and um, he was also very interested in the role that attention played on in constituting the world. I mean, you pay attention to things that you value one way or another. Mm. And what that means is that the world tends to manifest itself in relationship to your value structure. And yeah. that, that's a very troublesome idea in some sense, with regards to our conceptions of the objective world, because it's not easy well, to it's not easy to parse out what's objective when what manifests itself to you is dependent in large part on what you value. It's very complicated to sort that all out. Well, possibly very much later, we can come to the question of what objective and subjective mean and how one can 
I think it's a mistaken dichotomy. I think one can interpret the words in important ways that give them meaning. But I think to think of the just being an objective world out there and a subjective world in here is one of the problems with modern Western philosophy. But um, to come back to the creation of the world, I was going to say that not only does it sort of bring into the world the world that you know, which is after all, by definition, the only world you will ever know, um, but it also changes who you are. So the quality of the attention you pay changes you, the attender. So it's a very profound difference. And in the first book, The Master and His Emissary, one of the things I was expounding was how this business of attention creates a whole distinct world. So the, the hemispheres have, have evolved to, to two different sets of values. You mentioned values, and it's very germane. They have different reasons for existing, and therefore have different things they respond to. Um, and what I have tried to explain in that book is that this gives rise to a whole way of seeing the world in a whole world, which is not just for the individual, but also at times it becomes the way of looking at the world for a whole culture. Because of course, we're as individuals never entirely distinct from our culture. We... Okay. Oh, no interruptions. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that's, called, like, that's called self-control on my wow <laughs> I, I really am surprised with this this collection of people that not anyone felt any desire to interrupt um any anyone have uh any 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 particular uh thoughts on that that part of the discussion so there's a couple things i would like to bring out and i mean i th again i say this all the time but what i think a cliff notes of what you could summarize of what they just said is this quote that I love from C.S. Lewis, the magician's nephew. It's one of my favorite of his, but what you see in here depends a lot upon where you're standing. It also depends upon the kind of person you are. Like that's essentially what he's saying. Your value and attention is, <clears throat> is what that gives rise to what you see. That's what pops forth out of the infinity of what is possible to see what you value and and so that's that gets into the subject of objective dichotomy and then it also made me think of because <clears throat> he was talking about that happens individually and it also happens collectively so have you guys seen the <clears throat> the movie uh the documentary the social dilemma a lot of people talked about it about i heard i, I heard a lot about it but I, I didn't i didn't i didn't see it it's, so it's about like the social media stuff right yeah. yeah and so it's basically one of the big points that they make the main guy in the film the, I don't know if he's the filmmaker, but that he makes is that a lot of people in social media get really mad and they'll say things like they'll get mad at whatever side is opposed to them. And they'll be like, what world are you looking at? Like, how are you not seeing this? Like, why are you denying reality? And he said, one of the things that's, that they've shown though, is that, well, that's what social media is doing. It sets up its algorithms to show you a certain set of things based on what's going to get clicks and make money. And that's how the whole thing is set up. And it's showing other people a completely different world. So very literally, it is showing you two completely different worlds. And people are just mad because they are just like, what's going on? Well, isn't that a that is, isn't that itself a sign of a cultural breakdown? Because like in a in a in a healthy functioning culture, you wouldn't really have that much disagreement about things that are like just that basic base level, right? You wouldn't have people looking at the same set of information and coming to radically different no but that's my point the social dilemma's point is they're not looking at the same information okay the social media algorithms are showing them completely different things so like if you're inclined to the left it will show you left affirming studies and if you're inclined like i'm just saying politically because that's how the modern world basically is functioning now and then if you're inclined to the right it will show you those things and then both people are just like why is the other side crazy like, don't right. they see all this fact, all these facts and information, but it's showing you different because things. what they're paying attention to becomes reality for them and they can't. Yes. Right. But that's happening through through the social media. However, I think what McGilchrist is saying is like that also happens like 
whatever, throw out social media. That's, that's happening in social media, but that also happens in your own mind and in your own cultures, individually and collectively, you see different worlds which, based on what you value. Right, right, right. Which, which has a lot of like, if you start thinking about the kinds of things that we pay attention to in our culture, that has a lot, that's, that's how it has some harrowing kind of implications because the, the, the a lot of time a lot of the things we spend our energy attending to is not very good for us um so uh does does anyone have anything to say about the the subject object dichotomy well i had a question actually he, he said at one point the quality of attention you bring to it um, yeah, I was wondering that too. Yeah, can we can we expand on that? <laughs> because like, if you are basically being duped by your own ability to attend, how can you bring a quality to it? Like, this is the thing that I'm wondering. Mm. Well, there are modes of I, not only that, but there are modes of attention. This I, it's why I wanted to get. This is why I kind of wanted to bring up the subject object uh, dichotomy for a moment. Because attending to something as attending to something as an object and attending to something as a subject are completely different modes. Right, right. And as much as you are, and if you are attending to things merely as objects, oh boy, is that a problem? And the actual and the tendency of our rational left brain slanted view of the world is that we overwhelmingly choose to attend to everything as an object and we attend to less we attend to less and less things as a subject and in fact even the human person is being gradually emptied of all subjectivity so that it really just becomes like a hollow like just just a hollow man that's not really anything right well, I, th I think that the uh, you know like the whole identitarian stuff is an object objectification of of yes. individual totally. right absolutely yeah. right it's not it's non-personal it's non-relational and it's com and it's completely objective but like, that's this so this is all connected to i paul has said this many times like people are meant to be loved not to be used right yeah just kind of the opposite of identitarianism and objectification of people and you can like if you objectify a woman people talk about that well you're treating her like an object well that's yeah. That's a dead, materialistic, non-communal world. But you can do that with anything. You can treat this, and this is why I think your bigger, broader, general point, Nate, about the subject-object thing, is that when, when you are in fundamentally in that frame of philosophical materialism, where things are not alive and either imbued with like whatever panpsychism or the breath of God or whatever, if you don't view things as iconic and to some degree alive in god you know the trees clapping their hands yeah you need to uh, you, yes exactly so the reason that the subject object dichot the rod that raw dichotomy is wrong is because everything has both of you in and of you out to use harding's language yeah like, that's what i you know like when i the dichotomy arises i think when you when you when you keep those two things separated which is kind of illustrated in the corpus callosum itself. Yes. Right? So, you know, you've got these, this sub subjective, objective view of worldview. Can, can, you, can, you, can you clarify corpus callosum for those of us who may not be familiar with the term? Well, it's that thing <laughs> that separates the two <laughs> hemispheres of the brain. Okay. All right. <laughs> the bridge. The bridge of meaning. Okay. <laughs> the bridge of meaning. <laughs> the thing that connects the map to the territory. Oh, yeah. you just you just gave the whole bridges of meaning name a whole new layer of yeah. like, relevancy to me. There it is. There it is. Uh, <laughs> what in terms of how to conceive of what is being bridged? <laughs> we'll see what all the all the meme kings can do with that. <laughs> yeah. But all this, like this, this stuff has just huge ramifications. So you can apply it just relationally to people. I mean, it's obvious to see, like, if you treat your spouse or a family member as an object, that's not going to work very well. That's not going to create communion. But if you, but if you treat the things that you buy and consume, if you treat nature to bring in like Tolkien, if you treat the forests, you know, like, 
like they're objects to be used for your own advantage for your pursuit of power you'll rip them all down and you'll be then the world becomes full of dead objects rather than things that you are in communion and relationship with and and the whole world becomes dead but i don't think like this and is there, the and there's a certain like and in order to do certain like in order to do certain things within science like that's a necessary move right if you're like if you're viewing if you're viewing an animal as a as a genuine subject you can't vivisect it in fact vivisection is an ironic term because yeah. in order to vivisect something you have to see it as already dead otherwise you couldn't do the vivisection you have to be able to see it as a dead object in order to be able to vivisect it and that and that's all tied to to like <laughs> viewing the world mechanistically parts parts that make up a whole rather than seeing things as a, it's it's fundamentally well, here we go Number one, Luke Bingo, Mosaic Vision, because that's the, that's the like, <laughs> well, this is Paul, all his tropes that he does all the time. That's mine. But like, it's really, th these are ways that I use to illustrate Mosaic Vision. It's, it's viewing the world subjectively objective. It's both of them at the same time. And, and so when you, <clears throat> when you view something as, unities of multiplicity which i would argue that's actually how perception works which is why I like barfield like getting back to perception not just ideas that is how you see you see with value and you see holes you don't just see <clears throat> only the left brain divides and dissects things into parts you fundamentally see with your vision holes that's how you see you, you don't do your mind isn't doing the calculus of all these parts come together and there's a lamp you just see a lamp or you see a tree or you, you see unities i and think so like for me because i kind of see the world that way like i not to beat my drum or anything but i i have always felt connected like everything is a subject to me Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I was listening to him talk about that, I, I can I can understand like I can see people doing that, treating things like when you look at an animal behavioral science, for example, I'm always so frustrated by it because they see the animal as an object and not a subject. Right. right. They don't. It's not something that they're interacting with that's making them right. Like this is the thing, like the lamp. I have a lamp. And the lamp makes me who I am. If I didn't have a lamp, I would be a different person. And think, right? sure, right, Sherry. But think, and, and when you act, if you're able to actually adopt that view and to start thinking in that mode, think about what that does and what that makes of uh, of the role of of the human being as the mediator between heaven and earth. Well, I just wanted to read something from Harding because I think that this is really kind of interesting, and we might be able to talk about it, but. Go for it. He, says, he says here, um, a theology is the forerunner which prepares the way for philosophy and for all the sciences. The ideas of nature and cosmic order, of freedom and necessity, of personality and very much else derive from our historical preoccupation with the divine. Now, this is the part that I, I think is kind of interesting. Human love itself came down from heaven it is not that the gods are anthropomorphic, but rather that man is theomorphic. We know him through them. The visions of Newton and Einstein contribute to the beatific vision, but only because they are, as a matter of fact, its vision products. So what, what I think is interesting here is that um, we anthropomorphize the world. Like, Tolkien anthropomorphized the trees to illustrate to us that they are not objects, but that they are subjects, right? We should, right. And, 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 but, but we're, we need to be seeing, we need to understand that we are not anthro, we are theo, we are made in the image of God, right? And if we see the world that way, then everything becomes a subject. Yeah, and there's a, there's a way ahead. in which in which, uh, you know, he's talking about the quality of the attention you give forms the world, but, but it's a, re it's a relationality. And just like what you were saying, Sherry, about 
you and your relationship with your lamp. When, when you attend to something, it attends to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, we can't take ourselves out of the attending. If attending is making the world, what attends to you makes you. Yes. And, and so, you, you know, and, and it also, because we know this, like with the, with the orphan kids in Ukraine, I think it was where they were fed, they were given cribs, shelter, but they weren't given attention and they all suffered basically um, catastrophic neurological damage that none of them recovered from. And the best cases made it out and, and they had severe problems their whole life, like psychological problems because they were never given attention. Like just this, the basic thing, they were given everything else. They weren't given attention. Well, they and were so, never made. They were never made. Right. They were, ne they never became. Right. And, and so the, the, the world, the divine, the universe is paying attention to you in a, in a, in a way. And, you know, and, but it, it's, uh, it, because if you realize that like God's a good father, if, if that's, what's paying attention to you at like at the foundational level or at the highest level, then, then that shapes how you pay attention to it, everything else. You know, it, it's not just that if I change my mindset, I'll be able to attend better and then the world will manifest itself differently to me. It's almost like a level deeper. It's like, what do I think is attending to me? And then yes. that affects how I attend to things. Right. Right. And it's also how, right. And it's that attention. It's that, it's that attention that, ha that, that raises things up the hierarchy of being. And I would, all, mm -hmm. I, here's the other thing that occurs to me um, while you were talking, like, Jess, in light of what you were just saying, what do you think the connection is between the concept of attention and love? It, it occurs to me as you're talking that love is a, it, it is a particularly elevated, high quality form of attention. Right. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah, I was when Je when Jess was talking about when he was describing that interaction, I was thinking about agape because agape is the love that that transforms that brings someone into being. Right, and and when you're and and to love someone is to attend to them in the yeah. most high quality way possible. Like right. that's that's what you're doing, and the, to do that in the most high quality way possible requires that you sacrifice yourself so that you're full. This is why you have to sacrifice yourself because mm -hmm. if you don't sacrifice yourself, your full attention cannot be on the other. Mm -hmm. Well, and that gets into the, that gets into the kind of, well, Harding again, his four stages of development. I mean, that's, that's essentially like a, it is a reemergence of, of a heightened, elevated, self-aware, the infant level where you're just almost pure perception, but you have no self-consciousness, but then it's a resubmission of that, of that self, that I, that self-identity to completely to the other. And that's actually what it is to, I mean, you could, you could but I would say that the active listening or anything to hear someone you have to, you have to disappear to truly hear someone. Right. So the seer, the seer stage has childlike qualities in that it has, yeah. in, in terms of its openness, but the seer is actually developed beyond the child yes. because the child is actually, I mean, if you think about a child, a child is like sort of a receptacle for attention and is open to everything, yes. but the seer is able to attend fully to the other in the way that, that a child cannot. Well. Yeah. So I, I, the, I mean, the, the, the importance of the child is the, the being childlike part is gaining the vision that allows you to become a seer. Yeah, okay. but I think even more, I would, I like the term father and child better because, right. Because like a seer kind of is above the child and, and doesn't need the, but a father actually needs the child. When, when the child, when my kids attend to me, I'm a dad. Mm -hmm. If I don't have my kids, I'm not a dad. Right. So th there's a way in which my attention uh, forms them. 
and makes them become, but also their attention towards me does the same. Like it's a, it's a, it's a reciprocal um, relationship. And, and now there's a hierarchy in play, of course, because right. I'm a father and they're, they're a child. So this isn't like everyone's equal and they're, there's definitely a hierarchy, but it's a reciprocal one. And I, I guess that that's where love comes into play because. And, and it's a reciprocity of, of pure gift. Right. And the ultimate source of that is God. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and even like, I, I think even more foundationally, like if we're trying to like, if I'm attending to the world wrong, I'm, I'm not going to change that by, by, by disciplining myself to attend to things correctly. No, maybe I'll make some, there's some progress to be made there. I think the main progress is to be made by, by I have been attended to incorrectly and I don't understand the depth of the love of God who, that has attended to me from the beginning. I don't understand that. And then you should be pursuing the the revelation of how god attends to you and that change that'll change everything i think right right um, so yes I mean, it's kind of that, psycho analytic or something <laughs> is that kind no of but i think there's something really right about what you're saying because it's like it's like you have to like in order to know in order the, to know the prop this 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 highest quality mode of attention that we call that we give the name love, right? In mm -hmm. order to attend to people in that mode, in that self, you have to have seen. You have to have seen it. Yeah, you have to have seen it somewhere. It, it has to be attention towards you. It, Correct. It, yes, and, and you have so, to see it as towards you because you. And, so you're saying if you're going around, if you believe that you're just a fully, fully, you're a fully depraved piece of shit that you won't ever actually be able to see that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute now. I just want to ask this. Uh, Sorry, Calvinists. Uh, I love you. No, no, Even if I you don't, don't love me. <laughs> For yourselves. <laughs> um, okay. So, so what are, is this, is, am I getting this right, Jess? So you're saying, hmm. so you're saying. Um, <laughs> so what you're saying is that, <laughs> that you have to see yourself the way God sees you. Well, primarily as one attended to, and then you can attend in a better way. Right. Like, it, like, so, so your perception of God matters. Like if, if, if yeah. you think God is a judge, for example, then you would see yourself as a sinner. Um, mm -hmm. or a piece and of then shit. you attend to the world as one that is judging what this okay. reminds me of Jess and I don't know I mean Sherry and I both will be one of my another bingo things but the Rilke quote <laughs> uh, yeah, bingo. the deepest experience of God is one of bearing and, re and receiving which is which is feminine mm -hmm. and so you don't it's not it's not just like the gospel of just try harder, as I like to say, just like attend rightly, attend rightly, do the right, oh, yes, attend, yeah. fix your attention. Fix, what can I do? What do I need to do to fix my attention? Exactly. Let just your God, he's got you. Like you're okay. Just mm -hmm. stop. Or it's master Eckhart, I think has a quote of like the process of finding God happens not by addition, but by subtraction. Mm. Like just stop. Stop. I, I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how much, Oh boy, I'm going to go there. I wonder how I have to, <laughs> I wonder how much cutting, uh, I wonder how much like um, underemphasizing the feminine aspect of God, which would give us access to that, to that mother child level of attention. If we kept that feminine aspect in mind, I wonder how much of that has caused us to miss that part. Oh. <laughs> because because our vision of god is it is like even though god we know god intellectually we know god is beyond you know any any predication of of gender like and we know that there are lots of there's lots of feminine language that's used about god within the scriptures it's not like it's totally absent um uh, ruach is is feminine in hebrew 
Um, uh, there are lots of motherly images uh, used of, of God toward Israel in the Hebrew scriptures. Like the, the feminine imagery is there, but we've chosen to completely de-emphasize it. Um, this is particular, I think this is less of a pro problem for Orthodox and um, uh, Catholic believers than it is, I'd say for Protestants. So, um, but I would say even, th there's still something missing even there. Um, where... Well, I, th I actually think though, Nate, that we've de-emphasized God as father. You think so? Or we've misunderstood what a father is. Perhaps, but I mean, when Jesus, when Jesus refers to God, he always refers to him as father, right? Yes. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Right. right. And which is and, very, which is very peculiar that he chooses that consistently because there's yeah. actually only, I think, two Hebrew scripture references to God as father. It's very unusual. Right. I mean, it does occur within the Hebrew scriptures, but it's very atypical. It's not the but normal. It's, but it's because Jesus is the son. Right. Right. Like he's appearing as a son. And right. now God is a father. Right. So, um, and Mary was the mother, so, you know, like God doesn't have a motherly role in that, in that, you know. So yeah, the, and, the, and, the and the I church, would say the church is provides a motherly role, I think, ideally. Right. The church is the mother. God is our father. Um, yeah. and, the, and the church provides is supposed to provide a, the space for you to be um, it, it, the balance between protection and and freedom to become um, and teach you how to, you know, both, both being attended to and teach you how to attend to things correctly. You know, to get back to this idea of attention, we often have, we often have people I find who want to make the God of the old Testament different than the God of the new Testament. Right. But the right. idea is to bring those two together. And, and so like one of the things I noted when I when when Miguel Chris started talking about started the talk was that he said you know we are designed to eat and not be eaten and I thought to myself okay so we actually need dualism right we need like to survive we need to have these these you know these things um, we need to see the world dualistically let's say. Um, but the, the game is, is to bring those things together in such a way. And, and this is what I think wisdom is actually, because, you know, um, like he said, the left hemisphere doesn't know what it doesn't know. Like if things, if it doesn't know something, that thing doesn't exist, period. Right. right? Yeah. Hey, and, we haven't got to that part yet. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I, re I really like that, Sherry. That, yeah. that, that like we we need there's there's a you there's a purpose for dualisms. Yeah. Because we have to make decisions, and you have to say yes to this and no to this. But ideally, w what you want to do is bring everything together again, whole like in a whole picture somehow, and right. and and the whole picture governs. It the the dualism doesn't govern, doesn't rule. Right. This is, I, I would argue to bring, to say with McGill, Chris, I understand your point, but this, this is why I just beat the drum of vision so much because I really, and we talked about this the other day in the boxer. I really do believe there is a way to perceive the world that, that is not dualistic because dualistic is fundamentally left brain. If you're a dualist, the left brain's the master. It just, mm -hmm. your map, because it's on or off, it's a binary. The, the way to perceive the, I think the proper way to perceive the world, which gets you what dualism promises you, but will never act, actually give you is Trinitarianism, because it allows you to, to see options, to see difference, to see contrast, but to not be stuck in the binary on or off of it. So it allows you to correct your map. It allows you to have a map, but mm -hmm. for it to be corrected by transcendence. Yeah. You I, I, the world that way. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that, I, I think that, I don't think it's, uh, I definitely would say that dualisms are not like, uh, 
depending on what you mean like if you're talking about just like the evolutionary division of the brain into two hemispheres that's one thing um uh that 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 may be just be a feature of evolutionary biology but as mcgilchrist points out it's not inevitable and hasn't always been the case that the left brain has dominated but but here here's what i mean to clarify i'm not talking about the left like the left and the right brain, but I'm saying the left brain is dualistic. The right brain, the right mm -hmm. brain is, is, I think pre it's pre-articulate. I think you're right, which is why I, well, I don't know if it's pre-articulate. Well, it can articulate on its own. Yes. Right. And so, and so the dualism, so like thinking dualistically to say this or that can't exist in the right brain. Those are both explicit. Mm -hmm. Those are both left brain things. Right. The right I, brain is the thing that comes in that allows you, like when Peterson says, error, error is transcendence manifesting to you, allowing you to correct your but, math. But the right brain can use the left brain articulation as a tool, though. That's what poetic absolutely, diction, that's absolutely. what poetic diction is. And I would say that what McGilchrist, when he's talking about like the like these times in the past when we haven't been left he, left brain dominant in the same way we are he's pointing toward the same idea that barfield's talking about when he talks about original participation and we've we have become like our our, our the withdrawal of participation is really a historically rather recent development because if you go back and look at like if you look at even the medieval model which peugeot was pointing toward all the time um like it was a particip we were not in the f full withdrawal of participation in the medieval period. The medieval period was a participatory time. And uh, so um, in comparison to our current age. So this sort of like these stark, these stark dualisms, I really think are a product of left brain dominance, yeah, for sure. which has become more and more extreme over time. Yeah, okay. but. Like I'm not, I'm not advocating for dualistic approach to life. Like that's not what I'm saying. No, you're saying that we need the left brain too, is what you're saying, which is why I wanted to offer a corrective, because right. you're saying that and like that the left brain serves its function, it has its role, which McGilchrist would agree to too. And obviously, I mean, we have a, we have a bicameral mind for some like reason. Well, I'm saying actually a little bit more than that because. Okay. Because the left brain obviously poses a problem. The left hemisphere actually poses a problem, right? It can get, it can believe that it's the master and right. not the emissary. So what's, what's the game then? Okay, so here we are, we have this brain, right? That's bifurcated, that has a corpus callosum, which is, which is designed to hold things in tension, which is really great. I love that, right? And, and, and now it's like, okay, now you got to work with it. So, you know, I, I was reminded when I was listening to all of this, how in Proverbs, it says, you know, with all of your, you know, wisdom is, is supreme, right? With all of your, with all of your getting of knowledge, get understanding. And it seems to me that understanding is when the master and the emissary are working in tandem and there is no more weightedness on one side or the other. Like if you were only right brained, you wouldn't be very functional. Right. There'd be a lot of things you couldn't, you could maybe, you know, understand your world. It wouldn't be confusing because it sees things as a whole, right? But you couldn't write, you probably couldn't talk properly. You, you know, you, you may- I don't think you could do anything, honestly. Right. Well, you right. have to write brain. <laughs> right, so, so, so again, you're, you're in this, you know, biblical story of bringing things under control, like bringing your passions under control, bringing your bring, integration. I mean, that's the word that I always think of is, is a proper integration of these things. And so I guess when I said that previously, I was just pointing out that, you know, in, you know, in a very primeval way, we are, we need our dualistic approach, right? We need, we need to, be able to hyper focus on something, and and not, you know, th not think about how beautiful it is. I just you know? don't. Yeah, I, I was I, approaching I, you. Right. I just don't. I just. I just want to avoid. <laughs> I just want to avoid the idea. I. I don't want people to hear that and think that means that like, that that means that dualisms are necessary. No. Right? No, so, that's not what like, I'm saying. So I know that's not what you're saying. That's why I just want to make that clarification. That doesn't yeah. mean that oh, we just have to live. I think Paul would say that. Uh, for example, <laughs> but I don't think that's true. And I don't think, and I think that like, 
like I would think that we have all kinds of levels of argument. I think there's there there is a there's a sociological argument that demonstrates that, that that's not the case. There's a philological argument that demonstrates that that's not the case. You even have uh, actually in the Stephen Fry um, uh, Jordan Peter Co Peterson conversation, um, uh, Julian Jaynes was brought up who makes like a uh, like an evolutionary biology argument that like actually like the that the two hemispheres used to be integrated like from a from an evolutionary standpoint oh, um just... so um which barfield hated janes <laughs> by the way <laughs> but but in any case <laughs> it's still another it's still another piece of evidence from another way of looking at it that's pointing at the same idea that it's that that while we um our, our brain is is biologically divided into two hemispheres and they both have a necessary function viewing the world through a dualistic lens is not necessary yeah we could so i feel like we could do the whole conversation on dualism yes we could <laughs> it's a big deal i have a lot of things to say because the thing is i think a lot of times one last thing that i would like to say on that subject is i think a lot of people and this gets through this since all of my time in this community, this has been thrown at me as like the woo guy and the anti-propositional guy. And that people are like, you're anti-left brain, you're anti-confessions, you're anti-propositions, you're anti like seeing difference and dualism. And like, it's just this big woo fuzzy nothingness thing. And yeah. I'm like, no, that has That's never- That's how the left brain responds to- those kinds of ideas though. right that has never been my point and so even that but like the dualisms i think people construe it this way with the right and the left brain thinking is they think the left brain has this option the right brain has this option that's not the way it works yeah options are all in the left brain those are the left brain is the thing that sees options and chooses it's the thing that the, categorizes yes the right brain has the totality the right brain is the space that provides the options pre art like pre-verbally, pre-articulate. It's it's where everything comes from. It's right. the dream. And the, the left brain is the reason that Sam Sam, God bless him, is a Unitarian. Because because the left brain <laughs> because the left brain cannot rest with the paradox of unity and multiplicity. Yeah, you were talking about that the other day, and I think that's very, very true. That the impulse, and this is just a temperament thing, I think primarily, the impulse to not be okay with not being able to articulate something, like that, that feeling of discomfort when this, there's something that I'm, you know. This is what, yes, and so it. this is what, when, 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 when Barfield, you know, following Coleridge talks about imagination as a truth-bearing faculty, that's what he means. Oh, He's I got talking quote. about being able to take that holistic vision that you see and just trust it. Okay, I it is quote. intimately connected to faith. Yeah, you do your quote, but yeah, there's a kind of vision. That's people think see people equate vision or seeing with articulation. Like if I see something, I can talk about it. I can explain it. No, vision's much bigger than that. Way bigger. Yeah, I think articulation it has to do with laying out parts more than it does about singing. Yes, which is fundamentally left brain. Parts versus holes. But poetic diction is different. Yes, but Sherry. Sherry <laughs> well, I was going to throw this in with the idea of childlikeness and, you know, science and philosophy. When, when Miguel Chris talks about science and philosophy, but I think it fits in here too. So I'm just going to read it. In the scientific region of her duty of which we speak, the imagination cannot have her perfect work. This belongs to another and higher sphere than that of intellectual truth, that namely of full globed humanity operating in which she gives birth to poetry, truth in beauty. But her function in the complete sphere of our nature, and he's talking about imagination here, will at the same time influence her more limited operation in the sections that belong to science. Coleridge says that no one but a poet will make any further great discoveries in mathematics. And Bacon says that wonder, that faculty of the mind, especially attendant on the childlike imagination is the seed of knowledge. The influence of the poetic upon the scientific imagination is for instance, especially present in the construction of an invisible whole 
from the hints afforded by a visible part. Where the needs of the part, its uselessness, its broken relations, are the only guides to a multiplex harmony, completeness and end, which is the whole. From a little bone worn with ages of death, older than the man can think, his scientific imagination dashed with the poetic, calls up the form, size, habits, periods, belonging to an animal never beheld by human eyes, even to the mingling contrasts of scales and wings, of feathers and hair. Through the combined lens of science and imagination, we look back into ancient times so dreadful in their incompleteness that it may well have been the task of seraphic faith as well as of cherubic imagination to behold in the wallowing monstrosities of the terror teeming earth, the prospective quiet age long labor of God preparing the world with all its humble graceful service for this for his unborn man. The imagination of the poet on the other hand dashed with the imagination of the man of science revealed to Goethe the prophecy of the flower in the leaf. No other than an artistic imagination, however, fulfilled of science could have attained to the discovery of the fact that the leaf is the imperfect flower. And what I liked about that quote was the fact that um, it, it's a perfect description of, the, of, of this integration of the left and the right hemisphere, right? Of, of, of them needing each other. Like, this is why I said in the beginning, like, and I, I, I totally get what Luke's talking about. Um, I guess for me, I've, I'm trying to understand why I need my left brain because I don't use it very often, okay? And I'm, I'm starting to get the feeling that I also, this is why I wonder about my body because the left brain seems to be governed or the left hemisphere seems to be governing the functionality of my life, right? My body and um, and my right brain doesn't, it, it's not concerned itself with that. It sent the emissary off to do that work, right? And, and so I have that question because I don't do, I don't do left brain very well. And it, and it poses a problem for me. No, so Sherry, I think, I think you do. So back earlier when we were saying, you need the left brain to do anything you couldn't do anything if you didn't have the left brain. And I think it's because exactly what you just said, your left brain governs your body. But I think when you say you don't use your left brain, that much, I think all you're articulating is that you just by nature and fundamentally, your right brain has always been the master, which is why I think you see differently. It's not that you don't use your left brain. You do it all the time because that's, that's why you, you can't, do you, you can't write poetry without using both. Like, right. <laughs> because that's, this is, there's a reason why poetry is rooted in the image, right? So you have, you're taking, you're taking what you're doing when you're writing poetry is you're taking this holistic vision that the right brain sees, and you're trying to use language in a way that disrupts the left brain enough, mm -hmm. which is the, which is the part of the brain that we use to Well, actually, maybe, maybe it's more like, I just wish I was more left brain. So I didn't have to see everything at once. <laughs> yeah well i i it's I kind of overwhelming <laughs> yeah well, i feel that too because it's also i don't feel like i'm good at articulating stuff because that's what i can't and that's the same thing and i've maybe gotten better at that through time and talking to left brain people and having to be able to try to my desire to relate to people so much has forced me to be able to do it but i'm not normally good at it i can't I say this all the time, forest and trees. I see the forest. I don't know how to explain the forest to you. I can't, I don't know how to condense it. Like oh I just God. see the whole thing. I don't know how to, and I feel like most people, most people really like conversations that are very tree focused, very detailed, all these things. And I think that's because they fundamentally, they, they think their, their thinking has been trained to see parts and out of parts construe holes. And I just, by nature, don't do that. I'm the opposite. That's why I'm here to translate you, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're much better at that. And that's why I told you before, like, there are times, there are times when you say this, I said this to Nate the other day, where Nate will say things that I feel like I've been saying for two years to people. Yeah. And people like, oh, Nate, that was so great. That was so I great. know, I know. I like, what the hell? <laughs> and I will be the first person to acknowledge that you've been saying them. 
I'm struggling with envy, actually. (laughs) I just think that, like, I think maybe I'm, like, more, I I think maybe, let's see, I'm more of a whole brain person. Maybe that's it. Like, so I'm not, I'm neither either fully right brain dominant or fully left brain dominant. I'm able to, to, I'm able, I'm able to use both sides uh, in, in coordination well. Whereas maybe for that, the articulation part is for someone who's truly right brain dominant, the articulation part might be more difficult, but because I'm more whole brain then I, I'm able to do, to both see the vision and then bring that vision into articulation. Does well, you've said sense? this before, even your, your debate training. Yeah. To be good at debate. That's what that is. It, it's, it's all left brain stuff and it's training, it's that, well, left brain. training that faculty. And it's, it's not, and, and it's non-communication. It's, oh. it, 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 it's not talking, talking. It's total it nonsense. Yeah. It's total nonsense. Uh, it's a so game. I just, I'm just going to toss this in here because I had to laugh the other day. So when, when you, like when I, when I interact with the world, I'm always seeing it as a subject, right? That, that I'm in relationship to it and it's making me. And, yeah. I, and, and that, and that gives me, um, kind of a, you know, an innate sense of humility. Like when I'm interacting with my animals, for example, I'm not overly dominant. I don't think I'm the master. I don't, you know, I'm in relationship. To but that's how you're raising them up. Right. And, and so and <laughs> yesterday I went up to the barnyard and all the animals are out. I like to keep my animals as free as possible. And they're all, so I've got three horses I had a bunch of chickens and a, and a goose and all my dogs, right? And I, I, go, I go up there and I'm walking towards the chicken coop by myself and I can hear this little in the background and I turn around and every animal in the barnyard is walking behind me. <laughs> all the chickens, the goose and three horses and the dogs. Sherry, I, you're you're like the green lady in Paralandra. It's like, Snow that's White. What yeah. <laughs> that's what happened to her. No, I'm not even so so like that is a compliment, but it's also, I think, pointing to something true. That's what would happen if we were in right relation to things. Yes. We were living in communion with everything. That's what the whole world being submitted to the church, who then submits it to the head, which is Christ, who then submits everything to God that's that's it that's what it that's what it does and they do it voluntarily they do it because you're not domineering they do it because right. you're treating them as subject right the, 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 the greater to the greater degree the greater to we degree, ah, the, to the greater degree that love is being actually practiced yeah properly the less authority is needed within the hierarchy this is christianity within the hierarchy the greater serves the lesser that's yeah. it Every and, they, and, they, and, they're, and 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 the, the interesting thing too is that none of the animals are being aggressive with each other. Like the goose isn't chasing the chickens, the horses aren't chasing off the dogs. They're all moving together behind me. The lion right? lays down with the lamb. Right, and it's and it's because we have a, a respect. I don't even know how to put it. It's like I I often think to my like I say to people, look if you. Because they, they say to me, you can talk to animals. And I, and I say, well, no, I just listen. And when <laughs> I listen, then they perfect. talk to me. Perfect. You yeah. can talk to animals. No, I listen to animals. That's perfect, yeah. Sherry. <laughs> well, uh, I'm making myself sound crazy. Listening, and, and listening is attending, right? So to bring it back. Masculine versus oh, right. feminine. Yeah, it's attending. Um, okay, so hey, maybe we can go ahead and get a second, <laughs> second clip. Get a second clip in. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm actually going to skip skip over the second one because yeah, we've actually like we kind talked of about that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's do the house example. Yeah, that's what we're. Yep, that's where I'm. That's where I'm headed, Sherry. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, quality is replaced by quantity. Uniqueness is replaced by the category. And then again, the the left hemisphere um, tends to see things as um, 
inanimate, where the right hemisphere will see them as animate. Well, a category, it, it, a category but, implies in some sense that the, the uh, members of that category are indistinguishable, right? Because otherwise you don't have yes. a category, you just have particularity. And so you can exactly. imagine that, that, I mean, to understand this completely, you have to understand to some degree what categories are for. Sorry, or can I what, interrupt? Yeah, what? Yeah, that was the ground rules. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this will be this will be not quite. I mean, it's not going to be related to the total clip there. But when he said just to have a category, it means that the things within the category are indistinguishable. I would just quibble about the language. I would say things within a category means that they are there's some there's a unifying there's a there's something unifying them. It's not that they're indistinguishable. I oh, he's saying when you're thinking about a category as category, right? So if I just say, if I just say dog, and you're just thinking about the category dog, you might come up with like multiple different examples, but the cat, but the category itself is just there's no. It's like the. It has no particularity. Dog can be used to refer to any of the particular members of that category. That's okay. Well, I'm talking about something other than he's talking about. That's okay. good. Thank you for okay. the illustration. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's pick it back up. What categories are for, at least in part, you put things that you can act towards the same way in the same category. And so yes. young children might think of cats and dogs as dogs, all of them as dogs, because they're cuddly yes. pedible entities the not because they have four legs or because they have fur but because you interact with yes. them the same way then you can differentiate cats and dogs as you get a little older but the first category dog yes. which is pedible things is a perfectly reasonable category and you can imagine yes. that once a categorical structure has been imposed that it's easy just to see the category i i wrote an, yes. an essay in my new book um which is called beyond order about the function of artists. And I believe mm -hmm. that part of what artists do, and I think this is maybe, ref you can tell me, but I think it might reflect the differences that you're talking about. When I was a kid, I lived in a small town and I can remember all the houses on my block. Mm -hmm. I can remember them in detail. They're familiar to mm -hmm. me as individual entities, but now that I'm an adult, I live, I've lived on this street for like 20 years, yes. but the houses are indistinguishable to me. I can't see them yes. as different entities. And I think it's right. because I'm so familiar with the category house, which yes. is a practical category that I can't see yes. beyond the category. And it's very. Okay, let me stop it there. Um, Cause I know Sherry wanted to talk about the house. The house, house analogy. The house. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I thought of when he was talking about that was that um, well, there's the whole idea of childlikeness in here, right? Mm -hmm. So when he, he, like he actually says, when I was a child and I saw houses, they were all different. Mm -hmm. And now as an adult, I see houses and they're all the same. And, um, and I thought when you're a child and you see a house, it's not just a house. The more important thing is the, the family that lives in that house, right? And that house is defined by the spirit of that family in the house. And everything about the house is reflects the family that lives in it. And so as a child, you're making that interconnected connection to the right. house. Well, right. he actually, he, it, what's funny is that he doesn't talk about it here, but he actually uses the same house uh, example in his new book. Oh, and when okay. he talks about when he talks about it in his book, he kind of he as far as I'm concerned, he nails the reason why. And it's related to this idea of attention again, like the reason like he can remember like the, the specific details about the houses of his childhood. And that he can remember all the, that specific particularity so much more is that he was attending it because he was wandering around his neighborhood and exploring and discovering and yeah, now and now as an adult like ha house has just become this like flat category that he doesn't attend to anymore 
Yeah, but so I don't it think, loses its particularity. I think that that's a, a very propositional. Like I think Peterson's well, making, having a problem here. Right? <laughs> He's not getting it because because it reminds me of again that four stages of life by Douglas Harding. Yeah. Where when he talks about the the toddler looks in the in the mirror, the parent says, "Look, that's you," and the toddler goes, "Okay," and then runs around outside. Right. And and he is completely <laughs> absorbed into fully open to the being. world being. He's, yeah. no, he's not fully open to it. He's a part of it. Right, 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 right. right. He's, he's completely integrated into it. And that's why when Peterson, as a child, looks at those houses, he can see the differences because he's a part of the world. When he becomes an adult, he now is, you know, he separates it, it, himself. It's a relational away. interaction. Yeah, it's not just attention. It's actually a way of being in the world. And I think children are more i think attention is more apt. i i think that attention i think that attention is connected to relation though because if you think about the way we were talking about it um before and it's a very this attention is a very fuzzy word like which yeah. they actually talk about in this in this conversation but if, if you think about the way it, it, it like when we after we were talking about the earlier clip if you look at that, the way that we were talking about attention and we we related love to being like a very high quality mode of attention, right? That's fully mm -hmm. relational. I would say that when you are attending something, you are relating to it. But again, as I said before, there are different modes, right? So the, the thing is, are you attending it? Are you attending to things in an objective mode? And I would say that Peterson, the adult, when everything is just a house, he's attending to it in the objective mode. He's taken all the life out of the houses. Yeah, but the question though is why? Why? Why is that <laughs> because happening? of the whole problem, the modern world suffers. Right. Right, because this is what we've turned the world into. But as it's, but it's, which goes to show you that it's, by the way, the fact that we all experience the world differently as a child shows you that these dualisms are not, <laughs> they're not default. They are, in fact, culturally imparted. Well, it's also that idea, though, of relevance that Peterson talks about, right? If everything is relevant to you, you can't get anything done. Like, you, you, right. do, you right. do have to bring things down. So why do we think we need to do things? What's that about? <laughs> do I'm not kidding. I'm well, not he, kidding. He does he does make the distinction between quality and quantity. So the right brain's concerned with quality, the left brain's concerned with quantity, um, which, which is interesting. Like if you start accumulating things for no reason and you don't know why, right? And you're still not satisfied. Like you may have, right? You may be unbalanced where you need to, you know. The that's the whole. Who was that lady who was? you know, you go and simplify and you ask if this thing brings you joy or whatever. Oh, no, and then, man. yeah, that, that, that whole thing was all about quality and quantity. It's like, let's move everything down. To, let's consider everything and we'll consider it by quality. That, we're, that was awesome. Cause that she, that's sacramental worldview making right there. That whole book. Was well, yeah, I mean, it was so popular because people are like, I have I have tons of stuff and I don't know what any of it means. Let me I ask you that object. Let me ask the, you a seemingly the thing, thing, okay. <laughs> the only thing you're asked to consider what it means is like the new stuff that you're going to buy. Yeah. You're like, Oh, that means something. Then you buy it. And all of a sudden it, now it loses all its meaning. So let me ask you a seemingly random question that isn't very random at all. Okay. Why do we go camping? <laughs> I know why I go camping. Why do you go camping? Talk about I, why you go I camping. Don't, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Well, cause there's several things about it. Like okay. you, you want to, um, the quality of the time is different. Yes. So, so when you're out there, um, especially if it's just a, a short time every day, like lasts a week, um, and everything you do, you know, like you're thinking about, you know, I don't, I mean, I guess if you if you go camping all the time or you live this lifestyle, it's just what you do. But because it's something different, like I have to think about lighting my little stove and the food that I'm cooking and like everything's like thought through and everything has a meaning and, and there's a time for everything in the day. And this point in the day, we're going to hike and then we got to eat. So we got to prepare and like all this stuff 
has to happen. Um, that's one aspect of it. I have, I have some things to add. Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is where you're going, Nate, but I, th I think what you said, uh, Jess, is the quality of time is different. And I think there are reasons for that because there's a few. So here's a few of my tr trees to try to paint my mosaic. Here are the trees coming oh. at you. Oh, <laughs> Wim Hof. People know who Wim Hof is. Yeah. He's the ice man. He's this guy who climbs mountains without clothes on and like zero degree temperatures and takes ice baths and advocates for cold showers and says part of what's wrong with the modern body is that we have lost our connection to the natural world and we've become disconnected we are no longer connected to the natural world and so it's made us cold and callous and that's why our health and all these things are affected by it and then and the other thing is that hideous strength, the end of that hideous strength. Um, and then also the idea that like we live in now because of technology in this modern world, we live in these houses that are increasingly, like even now with COVID that are increasingly separate from the outside world. You know, like we get rid of spiders. We don't want dirt. We don't want vacuum. We want it clean. We want it sanitized, wipe the counter. And part of that's all okay. But like, there's no, we can't hear nature. We're, we're inside. We're not outside. It's this, it's this thing that is buttressed and put away from the outside. But then I, and then you can take that all the way on like a spectrum where you go all the way to that hideous strength where you, where you wanna create a world with artificial trees and artificial dirt because then natural world is gross, it's dirty, it's bad. We want clean, clean rooms. And we've even, we've gotten that way with, with our food. It's the whole hygiene hypothesis like kill all germs, kill everything, kill all bacteria and we'll be healthier. Are we healthier? My wife was just telling me they're seeing more and more in the medical world, anaphylaxis. So like allergic reactions where people can't breathe, it's happening younger and younger and younger to kids. Mm. We are, we, this is all a product of a divorce. <laughs> it makes me think of Frankenstein. Right, because of all, all of our doing just, just creates a world of artifice. Like, like there's no... Like, and then think about the things that, okay, think about the things that you're doing when you're camping as compared to the things that like, if you have, let's say you have a, a you know, a, t a standard like white collar corporate job. I happen to work for state government. So, I mean, my job is, I, I'm not Great working job. for private That's enterprise, but it's very, has a lot of very similar aspects to it, right? Where it's just like, most of what I do is complete nonsense. <laughs> It just is. It has no, it is, it, it is doing for the sake of doing that is, that is completely robbed of meaning. Whereas the things you're doing things. So I was kind of joking when I said, you know, okay. why are you doing, but I, I was talking about that, but this, I was wanting to get toward this particular mode of doing, which is doing for the sake of doing. Whereas when you, when, when, when you go camping, you're doing things that have actual meaning, then you're doing them for a real reason. You're doing it for the love of it versus a transaction. You're not. Well, just... Also, some of it is necessary. I mean, you got to you got to light up the can stove because you got to feed your family and people still have to eat. And so, I mean, but. It's making roads for the world, but it's still but there's but that hasn't but that's meaningful, though, right? Like yeah. you there's a clear there's clear meaning in that. It's like, oh, I'm going to prepare you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to prepare food over this camp stove or this, I'm a live fire cooking guy. So I would probably, for me, it would probably be just be, you know, directly over a fire. But, but the point is, is that there's, there, there's actual meaning to everything that you do. And like, and, and then you think about like, I'm, I'm glad, uh, the whole quality versus quantity thing. And it's like, like, if you like, what is it what is what is what is all of this about like there's just like our actions our our actions our day-to-day -day actions themselves are robbed of meaning no wonder we're in a meaning crisis like most of us the things that we do for most for the i mean like 40 hours a week is the standard work day so for most of us are spending 48 hours 40 40 hours a week doing something that has no actual meaning yeah it reminds me of a story i heard there were you know how there's organizations that'll dig wells in Africa for for villages that don't have clean water. But there was 
uh, I don't know how often this happens, but this one story is that one village, like they had to walk like two miles to go get water every day to get clean water. And so they're like, all right, we'll, we'll come in, we'll build a well for these people. It'll help free up time and all this stuff. So they dig the well and they said within a few months that the villagers had uh, destroyed it and filled it in because part of life was walking to go get water. And, and when they dug the well, they took that part of life away from them. And they decided they're like, we want that part of life. We want the walk to go get water. We want the talking that happens along the way because none of that, all, all that was disposed of when they dug the well. well. This So this, what you just said, that's like the perfect illustration of technological babble. That's what it does. And progress. That's That's the myth of progress and like, getting everyone more and more well. Why? Because you want them all to, to, to be on opiates, depressed and suicidal and taking Ambien? Like that's what we want the world to be? We want to yeah. gi- give everyone like our technological progress, but that is what that demonic idol promises you is health and wellness and e- you know, easy water. Won't that be so much better? And they're like, destroy that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> There's a demon in the well. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a point later in the conversation. I'm wondering if I shouldn't skip ahead to that clip uh, where, where uh, um, uh, well, we can just talk about it anyway. Um, and maybe we'll just skip over it later. Um, McGilchrist like asked the question, like, what is poverty, right? Because M- Peterson, oh, yeah. is, Peterson mm-hmm. is talking about like this sort of like this neoliberal, you know, solution of like gradual material progress and how he agrees that people find this to be a hollow story. Well, there's a reason why people find it to be a hollow story. It really doesn't have any meaning. Well, and, this the, is the, and the question, what is poverty that, that McGilchrist asks is a very important question to ask. Is poverty to be conceived of only in material terms? And if so, like how disconnected from that How disconnected from your own humanity is that? So when you were talking about camping, I was thinking, you know, there's that, there's that, do you work to live or do you live to work? Mm. Right? Right. Um, Idea. And, um, and so like Jesus said, man cannot live from bread alone. I mean, you have to work to make bread, right? Right. So it's not wrong to make bread and, and eat bread and, and do that. But that's not the thing that will actually sustain you right and so and and mcgilchrist uses that in um in reference to the his own question what is poverty and and i i actually think that poverty is a lack of wisdom that's what i think it is that's what poverty is because you can't navigate even the bread without it right you don't know how to make bread and and you don't know that you need more than bread to live you don't know any of those things without wisdom right and um, i would and, say and, i i would say in as much as you have wisdom the less the less material things like bread are are needed to nourish you sure that's part well, of wisdom is it, it part of wisdom is is to not be reliant on that materiality in terms of evaluating your your own your own wealth or poverty right and like, i mean this is this is what this is verbeke's whole project right is is to is to help people attain wisdom i mean i, I sat in once in a just a group chat on this on the verbeke server and they were talking about you know getting wisdom and and all the things they were going to do to you know, make that happen for them. And, and I listened for the longest time. And then I asked them all, why do you want, what is it for? Right, right. Well, I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a, right. I'll give you a real world example of this, like thinking about poverty through a different lens. Right. Um, Like when I was, when I was, when I was younger and, uh, and was like, um, 
still working as a line cook and like struggling financially, I would go to my, my wife's parents were like very well off. They had like a, you know, their home is like, you know, over $1 million valuation home, um, like very large property, like 30 foot ceilings in the entryway, like house. And we would go there to eat. And it's like, the food was an insult to food. <laughs> right <laughs> right right and and at home at, at home like even though i was working as a cook i would still come home, come home and feed my family and cook for my family and we would always say to each other we may be poor but we eat like kings mm -hmm. right because yep. because there was because that that was food that was cooked with with, with attention with, with right. attention to quality right and what so, you're and I couldn't spend. I couldn't afford to spend a lot on the ingredients, but I had the. But I had the skill to be able to take what I had, and make it both nourishing and delicious. Yeah. Whereas yeah, my in-laws, who dog. were you know quite wealthy, were eating from what I in what I would consider a very impoverished way, even though from right. a resource standpoint, they could afford. They could have afforded to eat better than I did, and yet they didn't. Yeah, so what you're what you're actually pointing at though, Nate, is relationship. Right. Right. <laughs> because because so back to this conversation I had on the Verbeke server, I asked them, I said, so what are you gonna do with all this wisdom? What, how is it, you know, why are you gonna acquire it? And they could only make it about themselves. So they would make better decisions, they wouldn't make mistakes, they could get the job that they always wanted. Right? It was this kind of this, this tool to fulfill themselves, right? right? And I said to them, but that's not what wisdom is for. Wisdom is to be shared. Right. That's, that's, what not actually, that's not actually wisdom. That's anti-wisdom <laughs> wisdom. That's anti-Christ. Right. And, it's, the, and, and it, it's, obvious, it, it's, it's obvious they've never spent any time like asking themselves why. Okay. <laughs> like, like, because like seriously like you could put them like 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 you could put them in a room with a three-year-old and they would automatically discover like how hollow that is because the three-year-old would, would would every time they would say well i want to do this because they would i want to do this because i want to do this they would ask them why mm -hmm. and if you follow those whys all the way down well all the way down you'll see how empty that is like how just how impoverished it is Hey, Nate, sorry to interrupt, but Michael would like to join the chat. Oh, that's Can wonderful. Let him? me go ahead and Can pause. No, no, I don't want him to. Okay, so uh, we're, we're, we're back live now. Uh, um, Luke had to uh, step out. Uh, and Michael will be joining us at some point in the, in, in the near future. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, play our next clip and then we'll comment. And if you have something to say in the middle of it, go ahead and interrupt and I'll pause it. Oh, come on not cooperating with me that's weird there we go there it goes well it's all part of the world picture which from the philosophical point of view is the purpose of the long book uh, which I sent to you in manuscript the the matter with things um, effectively I can state quite simply that I, I want to give a considered um, response to the philosophy of our age, which is that there is only matter and that things are understood by reducing them to their parts and this doesn't change them. It's a very naive philosophy. It's simplistic and it's immoral because it changes the way we treat the world and other people and nature. Um, it changes our idea of who we are in a very damaging way, ruling out things that other traditions have traditionally held as very powerful. And, you know, coming back to your comment about 
how people cling on to things that they believe. And it's much more difficult to try and see something in a different way, especially with age. This is why, of course, most traditions of spiritual growth um, enjoin on the person paradoxes, to see things in a completely new way that violates all the ways that they thought they knew. So I use paradox in this new book, but not in some blind way. In fact, I show that what we mean by a paradox is that the view of the left hemisphere of something and the view taken of the right hemisphere of the same thing can never actually completely marry up. They, they have different qualities. And if you push the comparison or the, the desire to make them logically come together too far, you end up with a paradox. And this started happening, you know, early on in the Greek, uh, the, the ancient Greek period of philosophy with Zeno. This is where the first paradoxes come from. And I have a whole chapter on paradox, um, which I see as generated by the desire of the left hemisphere to say it must be this or it must be that clinging on preferentially to the very fragmentary view of the left hemisphere. See, the left hemisphere is not good at understanding. That sounds a very blanket statement, and it is. But the whole of the first part of that book, the, the new book, is massively more thorough um, neuropsychology than is in the master and his emissary. So it's, a, it's, a, it's about as thorough as I could possibly make it. And what I do is I look at the ways in which we have any chance of getting an idea of what the world is. What are the portals of entry of, if you like, information about the world to us? And I take it that they, they de it depends very much on our attention, how we dispose our attention, perception, the judgments we form on the basis of perception, um, the ways in which we uh, apprehend what we're dealing with rather than comprehend it, in other words, grasp it, as we say, with the right hand of the left hemisphere, take it, use it, um, how we understand it in terms of emotional intelligence, which is not a small thing. It's the whole way in which we understand everything human. By emotional, I don't mean sort of um, in some, uh, you know what I mean. I, I'm talking about social and emotional understanding, the sort of thing that is absent in people with autism. Um, and cognitive intelligence, this may surprise people, but that all these things, and creativity. So creativity, intelligence of the cognitive kind, IQ kind, emotional and social intelligence, uh, apprehension uh, is a separate case, I'll come to that in a second, perception, attention, and judgment, all these are better performed by the right hemisphere, only apprehension is better performed by the left hemisphere. So the only thing the left hemisphere is better at is getting a hold on either an idea, very precise, clear one, or on a a thing that it wants to use. But all the manifold complexity which our intelligence brings to bear in order to understand the world, all of that is better done by the right hemisphere. And I can say that on the basis not just of experiments in normal subjects, but on seeing what happens when you have either left hemisphere damage or right hemisphere damage. To, to summarize a vast chunk of information, which I hope will be you know, there for people to read very, very soon. Um, it, it, to summarize that very briefly, what one would say is that when you have damage to the right hemisphere, your grasp of reality is the main thing that's impaired. You don't understand it, you don't connect with it. Your ability to understand what's going on disappears. Whereas when you have a right hemisphere, sorry, when you have a, that's when you have a right hemisphere stroke. When you have a left hemisphere stroke, the main things are you have difficulty speaking and using your right hand. They're practically very important. But essentially, the understanding of the world, the grasp of the meaning of the world, sorry, I've used these words grasp again, but the overall comprehension of the world is sustained by the right hemisphere. Okay, now, so the, let, the, let me ask you a question. Can I? Um, sure, go ahead. All right, okay. And then, then yeah. All right, okay. Let me just uh, make this point. Yep. Because I want to, you, people might say, well, okay, but so what? We've both got right and left hemispheres, so we're not missing anything. So does it matter? Well, yes, it matters very importantly for my philosophical project. Because as I show in the second part of the book, where I look at the proper 
contributions to understanding made by reason, science, um, intuition, and imagination. Um, what I can show is that in those attempts to grasp, we, are, we can see the world, we can see the signature of the right hemisphere or the signature of the left hemisphere on a particular model. So if we have two possible models of a certain action or a, an aspect of reality or of space or time, which I deal with in the third part of the book, and indeed in philosophical history and in the history of physics and so on, there have tended to be opposing views of the world. Once you know how the left hemisphere sees it and how the right hemisphere tends to see things, you can see the hallmark of the left hemisphere's understanding on a certain philosophical standpoint, on a certain scientific take of the world. And you can see the hallmark and the, the imprint of the right hemisphere in certain other ways of reasoning and of science and philosophy. So this is very important because up till now, We've never been able to judge between these two. We've got A, we've got B, we just have to go, hmm, can't tell, we can't reconcile them, we can't do without either of them. Hmm. That's true, we, ultimately that's true, but we can get a very sharp idea, I believe now, of which of these is fallacious, which one is going to lead us down a blind alley, which one is out of touch with reality, and which one is more in touch with reality. I just wanted to say that because it's behind the whole philosophical drift of my book, which is how do we know who we are? I asked Plotinus this question, who are we? That's effectively the question. What is the cosmos? What is nature? And how do we all relate? Sorry, I, I'll no. hand over to you. No, no. All right. Thoughts on that? <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> I've always thought that a paradox is holy. That was the only way that I could describe it. Mm. Um, and when I heard this, I, 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 I can you ask, can you elaborate on what you mean by holy? I really like that. Like like just I like that. Um, but I, I if you could just and keep talking about what you're talking about. But if you could also elaborate what you mean by holy while you're talking about the idea, that would help me. Oh, see that I was afraid you're going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I mean by holy. Holy to me is something that is is um, uh, what is holy. I would prefer to ask you what holy is, and then I'll just agree or disagree. <laughs> well, what occurred? Okay, to be like set apart, right? To me, yes, I, I'm thinking Something's... set apart, but, but not necessarily in that God is holy. So, like when you when you read about the um, the elders, the, the is it the twenty four or the four or the twelve? I can't remember which number it is, but in Revelation, when they fall down and they say, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God," right? Like there is nothing apart, there's nothing else, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like reality is that is God. And, but, and that is, is holy. And to me, a paradox. Reality is God. And that is holy staying with that. So here's what I was wondering when I asked the question, sure. I'm wondering if there's more than just like a, like a phonetic semblance between the idea of holy and the idea of whole. Oh, I, is I, that I, is that what our concept about the holy is trying to point at? Well, is that, I, I, I is that the whole in that sort of absolute sense? That's yeah, that's what I was kind of. That's interesting that you would say. It, at. Yeah, because that that's actually what I think, but I never said it because it's not the same word. <laughs> so I thought I was wrong. <laughs> right, it's not the same word, but if you think about, but okay. But phonetically, think, yeah. Phonetically, they sound, I mean, they do sound similar, whole and holy. Uh, um, they don't, I, I don't know if they have, I don't think they have an etymological connection. But when we think about, when we, when we, when we push both concepts, mm -hmm. I yeah. think, like, philosophically to, to what we're referencing, I think they are connected. Of course. So, yeah. and that, so that it is end up being more than a, more than a merely um, phonetic resemblance. Yes. No, you do. You end up at the same place because it's the one, right? So now it's, go ahead and pick up what, with what you were saying, if you still remember. Yeah. So um, to me, a paradox 
so fr from a, a, a materialist, let's just say from from uh, um, McGilchrist's point of view, a paradox is 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 kind of like the child of the marriage of the right and left hemisphere. Okay, mm -hmm. it emerges when those two come into perfect communion with each other. That's that that seems to me what a paradox is. And and it is it is utterly ungraspable, right? The right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, like the left hemisphere wants to grasp and apprehend, and the right hemisphere is comprehending, right? So there's too much information for the left hemisphere to process. And so they come up against each other in this in this paradox. Well, they come up against each other, and the paradox is then born out of out of this trying to apprehend and comprehend at the same time right and isn't it well paradox like one of the ways of thinking about paradox is is, is paradox is a way of, of of describing like the unity between two poles like that's what's really going on in a paradox right well like a really good paradox paradox is like douglas harding saying that at the center there's nothing right yes right right exactly that's, so they seem to paradox. be they seem to be opposites right so right. they they appear to they appear to be opposite opposites, but in the paradox, it turns out that those two things that seem to be polar opposites are actually a unity. Right. And the doctrine of uh, of of creatio ex nihilo actually points you directly in that. That's what it points at, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is like from nothing that the universe is born. In right? in, in Peterson's. Uh, talk with Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry talks about being an empiricist rather than a ra rationalist. And it yeah. seems to me like a paradox is something that's empirically true, but not rationally conceived. Right, right. And, and, and empirically true if you're working with the whole brain. The problem, mm -hmm. this is exactly the problem I have with like Stephen Fry. It's like, okay, be an empiricist. I have no problem with that. But why are you arbitrary? Why is the reason driving? Why is the left brain in control of your empiricism? Why not take in the full data set, the data set that your entire brain is bringing in? Why do you deny blackbirds a sense of wonder? I told you I bring that. <laughs> I told you I get to that. Like seriously, it's like, what, how do you empirically know that a blackbird has no exper has experience of wonder? What what access do you have empirically to the internal workings of of the blackbird? The only access you have is is access through 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 your own, and the logical assumption actually is to assume that it also has a view in as well as a view out, right. and very well and, might have a sense of wonder. So, but if Fry did that, he would end up with a paradox, right? Like he would, if he was to take take that and and marry it right to this comprehensive view of the world, then he would end up with this child called the paradox, right? And that's why to me it's holy because, and whole, because it's the two, like from a, a purely scientific point of view, it's the two hemispheres actually working in tandem with each other, the way that they should be. And, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and it's, the old, it's, like the oldest philosophical paradox is, is that, that, is the is the paradox of unity and multiplicity which is what the mystery or paradox of the trinity is there to resolve mm -hmm. yeah but jesus, it's, jesus, yeah, yeah, jesus yeah. talks about paradoxes all the time the first shall be it, last right what was that like jesus is speaking jesus likes to throw paradoxes in all the time right the first shall be last because that's right. like spiritual wisdom has always been communicated through paradox like right and which and, is and what which is what McGill, McGill Chris is referencing. And the, there's a reason for that. Like, because that's how you get the vision of the whole. Yes. yes. Right. That's, that's, that's the, that's the biggest map that you need to do right. everything with else within. Right. But so it's the also an indicator. So, don't you think though, it's also an indicator that the right hemisphere, because the right hemisphere is comfortable with ambiguity, right? Yes. And the left is not. And so if you right. can handle paradox, then you know, I would think, that the that it's a good indicator that your right hemisphere is the master in this case. Right. 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 
And to have spiritual wisdom, we need to be able to to we need to be able to sit with paradox. We yes. just do. Right. And, like or mystery. Mystery is another way of talking about like mystery is like maybe a more uh, specifically Christian way of talking about the same idea. Well, mystery to me is something that you can't actually grasp, but it's just so layered and so deep that you never actually get to the bottom of it. Whereas a paradox to me, so so the reason, like what I find interesting about paradox is that it's ungraspable, right? It's ineffable. You can't, you can't hold on to it. You can't describe it. It's not rational. You can't use your reason or your logic to, to come to any terms with it. So in a sense, it's like God. It's it's yes. in a sense right. So this is why, ineffable. right? So it is, yes. So our religious sensibilities always have to be connected to the right brain, I would say, because they are transrational by their nature. Mm. So if you are if you are going to try to rely exclusively on your left brain to understand religious truths, it will invariably lead you astray because you won't be able you won't be able to see it. Well, you'll be in, you'll be exegeting everything right <laughs> right right which 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 is vivisection <laughs> you said it not me <laughs> i did what is that what is that yes you're right and what do you what is the subject of the vivisection of that kind of theology the body it's god yeah it's god that's the, that that is what kills god mm -hmm. this is why <laughs> that's really what <laughs> it's that god <laughs> It, it, it's it's that god that nietzsche is declaring dead right and that god is dead yeah because it never was it never was alive because it comes from a kind of thinking that renders the world a, a world of dead objects and every object that it subjects that it subjects to its analysis well it's like that, that it puts on its examination table has to be dead including god right like like that max Mueller quote from uh from mcgilchrist earlier he says none of the things that words represent actually exist. Right? Right. <laughs> there, there's a, uh, who was, man, I forget his name. Was it, it wasn't Nate, Nick. Remember Nick on the, on the discord? Yeah. yeah. He, he talked about how in his experience with his cults, like part of a cult was being able to, have elegant resolutions to paradoxes or at least hold paradoxes at its, at its core. And he, he talked about how re religion, good religions do that too, which is you, you ultimately get to some sort of paradox at the core. And I, I wonder, cause, cause even like when we poke fun at Calvinism and, you know, predestination, let's say, and then double predestination, we're like, this is a paradox. It doesn't work. And the, the Calvinists will maintain it. They'll just be like, yeah, that's the paradox at the core of Calvinism. But what, you know, but what is the paradox serving, I guess, is, right. is a better question. So, so like the paradox at the core of universalism, let's say people, they like to point out like if universalism is true, then why, how does God judge? And the universalist says he still judges. He's still a judge. He's still, um does all these things but it's just in the end every love you know love wins or whatever it is mm -hmm. and and the uni universalist has this paradox at the core you know i i wonder if um but i i'm not sure if those are paradoxes are those paradoxes like i'm ask, I, uh, genuinely asking the question oh i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm <laughs> like because to me, it's a. Well, I would say that, that the Calvinism is a rejecting paradox because the paradox is free will and determinism. It feels like to me. Right? Yeah. It's decided. It's decided. It's decided a paradox between free will and determinism in favor of determinism. Mm -hmm. You you have more experience with Calvinism. I don't want to. I don't want to straw man Calvinist theology. Um, you have more. Well, would don't... you say that's a fair character? It, certainly, it's the pop. It's certainly a fair characterization of the popular understanding of Calvinist theology. Mm -hmm. Is that it well, sides. I mean... That I it think, ultimately decides to resolve that free will and determinist paradox, but 
in favor of determinism. I would say that I would but say, it, but it runs into the next paradox, which is like, how can, which, which is trying to hold uh, a deterministic God with a loving God. You know, I was thinking about this whole sure. thing, this whole, um, so like the fact that, you know, what Max Mueller says, none of the things words represent actually exist. So the fact that you represent something uh, stops the presence of the thing, right? Which is, which is what Barfield talks about when he's equating this with idolatry. So suddenly, if you think you know God, like if you think you know what God is up to, then suddenly he becomes an idol, right? Because you stop at it. The God and you know, the, the God, the, the the God that you think that you know, in that grasping right. kind of way, that well, the left, you possess that, it. that you think you can apprehend, and that that is by definition an idol. Right now, you can know God, but you have to know God relationally. That's the only right. possible way to know God. Right. And, and relationally, even within our own human interactions with each other, we don't know each other. Right. Like even with our most intimate partner, right. we have to admit that we don't actually know them. Like and the question to bring this back to the whole Calvinist issue is like, I don't understand. Please explain to me how anyone can relate to the Calvinist God. Well, I, I'm can anyone sure. make a case for it? Like, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm open to like some, I mean, I'm open to the possibility, but I, I don't. Well, there, I, there are ways to work it, work it, you know, I mean, the, you know, there's obviously ways to work it because people claim that they know God and that they, they, you know, but they always. Yeah, because, have, well, that's, like, McGilchrist will say later on in this conversation that ultimately that the theology doesn't matter. What 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 matters is the way it has it ultimately has no impact on how what matters is how we relate to God. And I would say the how we relate to God is is important here too. Of course, because we yeah, need to relate to God as a subject and not as an object. And that rationalist theology is only going to lead to relating to God as an object. That's mm -hmm. the nature of it. So if you're relating to God as an object, what is that? <laughs> we have. It's an idol. Well, it's because, you know, George MacDonald talks about separating God into offices, right? As magistrate and father, for example. He uses those, those two examples. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if you think about that, um, then God becomes an officer. Like he, he's, he's, you know, if you, if you don't, see, I don't know how to say this properly. If you don't realize that, that, both of those positions are the same thing, which is paradoxical, right? right? Like that's justice and mercy. How do you, how does God show justice and mercy? And this was kind of the conversation yesterday. But the reason that God can be those different, those different things, those different like modes is because God is first and foremost a person and, and person and the, the entire idea of person is, is a relational being. Right. I mean, the best the best example I can think of for justice and mercy is when in the story of Lilith, Adam cuts off her hand and she goes to sleep mm -hmm. and it begins to heal immediately. Right. Um, so there's a there's a sense of you can't go to sleep with that thing with that with your hand clenched closed holding on possessing that last particle right that harding talks about you can't do that that's not right right so i'm going to cut it off and you're going to sleep and i'm going to heal it right that, that and this is how justice and mercy are the same thing mm -hmm. it's the same operation it's not two distinct things right well i would say that like i i would say that like okay so if we take jesus very seriously when he says that if you see me you've seen the father mm. right and we look at what if we look at the life and ministry and death and resurrection of jesus and if we're looking at those things and we're truly looking at that as as our image of as our image of the father then it shows us that our ideas about things like power and glory and justice are all inverted 
-hmm. It turns out that 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 love is the ultimate power. It is mm -hmm. literally the force that creates a universe out of nothing. So power is love. And any notion of power that is not love is not God's power. That's and your right. power. That's your grasping, grabbing, seizing, controlling power. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you look at what happens to Jesus, like, He's not, he, 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 he actually, he actually talks about going, going to the cross as coming into his glory. Now, what human being would see that as glory? Mm. He's inverting all, he's our, he's inverting our understanding of all of these things. This is what I think, this is where I think Calvinist theology like goes astray is it's like, it assumes that our human versions of these things of sovereignty of power of glory of justice actually are related to those things from the divine perspective well, actually assumes... and i would say that christ shows us that that that, that in, in reality that from the the divine versions of those things are completely inverted from our own understanding right like i, I would i would even go so far as to say the whole idea of the glory of God in, in this worldview assumes that the object of his love is himself and not the person, not that, not humanity, not creation. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, that, that is right. We, and, and this is exactly what you would expect with something that has gone, that has gone too far from the mode of the left of the left brain is you would expect it to just create a God that is nothing but an egoic projection, which is exactly what it is, right. which is why, which is, and it's so ironic. It, it the iron, the ironic part about it is that it blinds itself to that's what it's doing be, because it, 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 it sees itself in, it's it, because it, it claims depravity. It's like, oh, well, because of depravity, that's not really, that really can't be what we're doing. Hmm. Actually, I'd like to ask Luke, because I don't know if you heard that or not, Luke, but I just said that in, in the Calvinist worldview, um, uh -oh. That, <laughs> oh, Luke's that, back. That God, um, it, it's assumed that the object of God's love is himself, like that he's glorifying himself and not the object of his love being me or you or creation or whatever but that it's actually well, yeah no yeah. this yeah, no. is what this is exactly what i was trying to talk about with cal and michael because in a calvinist metaphysics i can't i don't know what their ontology of a human being is right what right. is a human being that's, that's why right. that's why my question was what well, is man because what you're saying is true there's they will say god loves because it's all of this, like we, you have this total frame, it's a package. You have total depravity, which means like all of your good works are like as, as filthy rags. You can't, even your good works are bad and mm -hmm. repudiated by God. <laughs> Any, any, anything that you would do is bad. The only thing that is good is the meritorious, righteous acts, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the only reason God... So this is where like the only reason God loves you is because of Jesus, but they don't, but they don't have a mystical metaphysic of like panentheism that just, that is like, or, or like of Karl Barth, for example, or something where it's me in Christ. Like I actually exist. I am something. This is where I can't make sense of a Calvinist metaphysic. I don't know what I am or well, what you person. are. There's no personhood. Well, I think there it's, is no I think, personhood. I, th I, think it, I, th I think theologically that it can't even happen unless your idea of a person is just an atomized individual. I think there's a reason why individualism and Calvinism, Calvinist theology, like grow up together historically. Oh, that's a good. Point. But I don't. Even so know I think what that it, means. I think I mean, it has a. Com I, I think what I'm saying is it has a completely non-relational view of a person. It's the cogito ergo sum idea of a person, which is why its theology is nothing but an egoic projection. I mean, I get that too, but even then, like, I think this is where I, if you push it though, you could say, yeah, it's individualized, but I'm just like, how do they even exist then? 
Like this is this is why I think fundamentally nobody acts that way. It, it's an it is egoic intellect because it's not real. There's nothing real about it because even you as an individual, you can't make sense of the of the being of the individual apart from a communal aspect. This is why relational ontology right. is fundamental right. well, this to is anything also, that is. Right, and this is why also like uh, David Which, Bentley makes the point in that all shall be saved that if your loved ones go to hell, let's say, um, in this theology, you can you can actually look down on them and not feel anything. Right. And it makes the point that if your personhood is intact, then you will. You're in hell with them. Well, if, you're, you'll, if you're a yeah, person, exactly. if you're an actual person, if you're yeah. the kind of relational being you're actually called into becoming, you will be in hell with them. Right. So if you can eliminate personhood from the get go, then hell remains a possibility. <laughs> That's right. No. Yeah. It entirely, it entirely rests. I, I'm not, it entirely, as far as I can see, this, it, the, the theology, its theology rests entirely on this notion of the person as an atomized individual. If you, if you have a proper relational understanding of person, you can't, you can't construct that theology because you would immediately begin to see how it doesn't work at all because you immediately start to see the connections between all things. Well, and ultimately, and ultimately too, it's, it's monistic and it's pantheistic except for within some weird Trinitarian thing, because, because there isn't, there isn't unity and multiplicity because eventually, eventually it's God, God playing a meaningless Christ. game. It's God playing a meaningless game with himself. As far as I can, as far as I can see, yes, see, it, it's, there's no difference between Calvinism and nihilism. If, if taken seriously. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what you just said previously about Nietzsche, right? Saying that God is dead. Yes. When, when you, when you kill God, then you end up with in nihilism. Right. And, and, and like I said, and I'll say it again, it's a vivisection. Or if you're worshiping it, or if you're worshiping an idol, that's nothing in a, but a projection of your own egoic intellect, you are, it's not, it's indistinguishable from nihilism because the thing that you're worshiping is not real. It has no actual being. And it always boils down to idolatry, actually. Like that, this is why in, in saving the appearance Mm. calls it a study in idolatry because correct. Yeah. As soon as you stop short, as soon as you lose that ambiguity, right, that you gain from paradox, as soon as your left and right hemispheres stop working in tandem together properly, then you have reached that point of idolatry. Like you're, you you know, I, I, right. You have to be able to rest with the fact that not knowing is the purest form of knowing. Well, that yeah. and that <laughs> is the this is the fundamental problem of the West, not for every group, for That's every right. group in the West. No, actually, but what we've done is we've been so successful, we've been culturally so successful that we've exported our mind virus to most of the world. Yes, yeah, which is the point that I made in my first conversation with Paul Vanderclay about egoic intellect, and then he challenged me. We went off the rails. Well, this is what this is why I think in the you know in in many um, like I don't know I don't know about the Catholic faith very much, but I'm assuming and also in Orthodoxy that the stress is placed on the fact that God's essence cannot be known. Like there's just you know no way that you can know that because if you you know like I, I wrote down here when I think I know what I'm worshiping, it becomes an idol. Yeah, it's it, it's the apophatic, the unknowing, the right brain is always ultimate in Eastern theology. It always has been. Yeah. Yeah. You can't think you know, because once you do, then you And I would say the off. same thing is the same thing is true in the theology of the West prior to about prior to roughly thirteen hundred too. Like I think right. like, this is why like you know, Peugeot Peugeot uh, is always talking about like the medieval model. Like mm-hmm. the medieval, mm-hmm. the medieval age was not like our age. It was a, we, it was a participatory age. Like we didn't, we, the, it ha, we had not yet entered the, to, into this complete withdrawal of participation that is characteristic of, you know, the, this early modern that really begins in like the early modern period and happens. I'm not, and I don't, it comes up along with 
these kind of kinds of like extreme Protestant theologies that we're talking about. I'm not saying that those theologies caused it because actually that would be totally unfair because the roots of those theologies are actually found in Catholic theology in the early 14th century. You should uh, actually, well, I, I'm going to recommend to our viewers <laughs> that they watch the episode <laughs> Luther from yes. Reiki. That'll give you a, a really good breakdown of how God became so distant and removed, right? Which is what Barfield talks about. You know, this is this 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 with this period of withdrawal, right? Um, it's not God withdrawing from us; it's us withdrawing from God, right? Um, God is always he's, he's everywhere present, filling all things. Right? Yeah. Where will I go to escape from your presence, O Lord? Yeah, right. I mean that Psalm is one of my favorites. I have a I have a question and a proposal. Can I insert this? Yeah. So. I, I wondered how everybody started talking about Calvinism. We always get on a Calvinist rant. And, but then, but then also, I think, I mean, I want to have another, I talked about Calvinism with Mary Cohan a long time ago, and it's come up a few times. I would love to have a conversation with you guys if you want to, but I want to talk to a Calvinist, but like a, a, a currently affirming Calvinist. I, most of my adult Christian life, I actually was a Calvinist. So I think I understand the theology really well, but I think it's just too easy. Like we just, we can well, sit but, here and dunk on Calvinism all day. High five. Well, we're other. talking, and we're talking about, <laughs> but to be fair here, we're not talking about reformed Christianity, period. We're talking about a particularly rigid traditional Calvinism that is like a sub branch within the broader reformed tradition. I don't yeah, think, not, like, yeah. like, for example, like, like I was listening to um, uh, a Martin Beeler talk on the Trinity, um, who's a who's part of a of a Swiss reform church tradition, um, who is um, broadly educated within the medieval Catholic tradition, and has contributed to Catholic uh, academic journals, like his theology would not look anything like what we're character caricaturing here so there's a lot of yeah. like the reform tradition is 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 pretty diverse so there's it's a particular right. kind of of rigid like strict calvinism that we're talking about just just to be fair because i don't want to and even people hold that and again like mcgilker says it's like ultimately your th your theology does not matter um, mm. it's re it's your relation it's your relation to god that matters so and there are a lot of people who are who who are yeah who may hold these theological ideas who are still finding their way into to live into the kind of radical relationality yeah that we're so like are you anyway are you an act as if calvinist or are you like paul vanderplay <laughs> <laughs> who is who is not an act as if calvinist so but here's my proposal. I want to talk to a Calvinist and then we could also bring in Sam because Sam is good in these conversations. He's really good at steel manning everyone's positions. Um, Cause I do, I, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. They're, they're, we talk about this often. It's, it's not only that I think my main concern with Calvinism isn't that it's just like logically inconsistent and can't make sense of its metaphysics and ontology that's a concern. My concern is, is that it creates a deep sense of fundamental self-loathing and hatred that I think gets people into really unhealthy places. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I'm still working it out. And I actually, I actually think it's present in like pretty much all of American culture um, that I think we have a, yeah. a very deep rooted mistrust of <laughs> ourselves because of a, a a certain form i mean people argue all the time that's not what total depravity means but it's a certain form of total depravity that it's the one that i was explicitly taught um that essentially like everything about us is bad and the only reason that god loves us is christ and like even that okay even that i can get on board with but not in a sense where like i don't exist you know what i mean like i have to exist in that it's not yeah, as if God only loves Jesus and that and that I am just this thing. Well, you I, are. The, I don't know. You are the vehicle by which God glorifies Himself because the object of His love is Himself. 
that's the problem with the theology. Yeah, and that's not even completely wrong because, like, this is. I mean, listen, I know all this. John Piper, God is. This is John. John Piper says this, right? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. But that is all true. That that is all true. But then my question is, you can't you can't have a whole system of theology that discounts the being of us and we in that whole phrase, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yes. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. We shouldn't get off on this, this little rant. <laughs> <I think. laughs> but it's tied to all this. It, it is tied to an extreme. So my experience, it's tied to an extreme left brainedness. That's a very closed system because this is the thing about the left brain. I don't know if you guys talked about this is like, it's, it's a, it's Jonathan Peugeot. It's a six, six, six. It's a totalizing system. Yeah. The left brain cannot, when you, when you get into a, and Peterson talks about this with like self deceit, when you lie to yourself, you actually poison your very organ for being able to self correct. Well, and you're when probably, your left brain. Oh, sorry. Huh? You're probably, you're probably <clears throat> what you're doing when you're lying to yourself just dawned on me is that you're, you're building up that capacity of the left brain to think of itself as a master, right? Because yes. the, the left hemisphere doesn't know what it doesn't know. So absolutely. Right. So um, the more you lie to yourself, the more the other, the truth doesn't exist for you, actually. It I don't think that, right. I don't, I don't think you I don't think, I don't think for the right brain, even the concept of master exists. No, no, no not for the right brain. No, no. it doesn't. But Which is my, why it's my, so my, easy for the left brain to become the master. Yeah. But here's my point with like having a conversation with a, a reformed person, or I'll just, I'll, I'll say it this way. Here's, here's how a conversation would go with my current self, with myself from 10 years ago. It, it would be, it would be, it wouldn't be a conversation with a person. It would be a conversation with somebody who was ideologically possessed because someone where the left brain is the master is ideologically possessed because it's a closed system. You actually have formalized and systematized a way anti-revelation. Nothing can come from the outside to correct your map. Because the you're map not, is everything. Because Luke, you're not seeing yourself as a person in that system. Mm -hmm. You're just an individual. You're not a person. You're not a person because you can just you you can just be folk. I I I just I'm just worried about my own salvation fate. Like I want to make sure that I am. I want to make sure that I am saved, and my salvation is not caught up with the salvation of anyone else. And if they well, that's in, because salvation is viewed, yeah, completely individualistically. Correct. Yeah. Right. This is the root of it. This is the root of the problem. It does not understand what a person is. Well, it doesn't understand unity and multiplicity. Then well, that the being intrinsic to personhood. Yeah. Yeah, God, right, exactly. If God is if God is using you as a vehicle by which to glorify himself, then you are you are actually objectified by You're God. You're an object. And so is You're an object. Yes. Well, so yeah. is, and, there, and there's no there's no reciprocal, like what Jess was talking about before, interrelational, reciprocal becoming, because you're not in relation. But that God is an object too, because that God is not acting relationally. Well, therefore, right. the in, therefore, the entire world is in fact a world of dead objects. Like yes. all that nihilism is, is this kind of theology taken to its logical limits. Yeah. It, it, the, nihilism only comes nihilism has to be built on the it is built on the foundation of nihilism is this kind of theology right and it begins so do, you, do you think the meaning it, crisis and, is because and, and of calvinism it, be, it, it, be, it begins by having a it, it, it's beginning error is having un, a univocal understanding of being that collapses this it collapses this, the distinction between being and becoming. Ironically, it actually suffers from the same error as like open as open theism or process theology, but from the opposite viewpoint. The problem so with process theology is that it only takes the point of view of 
of creation and the problem with calvinism is that it only takes the point of view of this idol god and it doesn't it doesn't understand what the relation the proper relationship between being and becoming is so well, it, for process it, theology it it's all be, for process theology it's all becoming for for uh calvinism it's 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 all it, it's it's all ultimately being which is why it's deterministic because everything is fixed yeah but this is where i i would push on it they don't even have being I mean, you have to have unity and multiplicity to have being. There has to be there, I, thou, and bridge. There has to be yeah, something. Yeah, it will other ultimately than, collapse. In order yes, to, right, for, precisely. This is why I said I've already. This is what this is when I say it collapses in denialism. That's what I mean. That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. Because there, it doesn't. Because there's actually. Yeah. Because when you try to cling to being in that absolute sense, it collapses into nothing. Well, yeah. you and even life, God has redeemed lose. even that. <laughs> okay, this, you know like so this this book here the hierarchy of heaven and earth is written by a guy who came out of a very strict calvinist tradition yeah. okay and his first sentence in here luke is this book is an attempt to discover for myself what i am and what i amount to why did he ask that question <laughs> why do you think he asked that question i told this i said this to, to nate and james i said i know exactly why he wrote this book because well so keep going he sorry there many, he doesn't have uh, there's no reason for him to exist in in the no, world i, I see that right. i see that but like here so here's the thing i have an inner calvinist i've sat through <laughs> me to exercise i've that. sat through well i mean it's just it's just part of my consciousness congress. Yeah, you, I mean I've listened to thousands if not I have tens an, of I have an inner Pentecostal. I have an inner Pentecostal too, Luke. I mean right. it's not right. <laughs> of per, so so my point so my point with that is like read your read read that line again, Sherry. Mm -hmm. All right, coming right up. Uh, this Douglas book, Harding's point, yeah. This book is an unconventional attempt to discover for myself and in my own way what I am and what I amount to in the universe. What am I? That is the, the question. That's what he says. Let me try to answer so, it as honestly as I can. So, so I, I know that culture and what that, the, the cultural response, the, the, the canned kind of response of what you would say, what I 10 years ago would have said to that question would be like, well, you're starting with man. You're starting with I, you're not starting with God. And there's your heir. That's, an they would call that an anthropomorphic. Humanist. Yeah. They would call it a humanist mm -hmm. theology, a yeah. humanist thing. And they're saying, you're not, <laughs> you need to start with God and his glory or else you'll misunderstand everything. You won't understand yourself without starting with God. I mean, that's what they would say. How can you? But that's because, because, the, and that's not actually wrong, because you are the image of God. <laughs> what is the? Yeah, I agree. And see, here's the thing: is like they would have found that how, also. But at, I don't. At I wouldn't say that you level. can't. I, you can't really do that, though. Well, what? no, it goes sideways because it stops. It stops short, right? Like so. Uh, anyway, I lost my train of thought. Well, I would. The first question I would. Okay, what would what would be the Calvinist definition of God? Then would be the first thing that I would. Because I don't even see how that's even possible. Where do Where do you see it going sideways? I, I'm just curious. Luke. Did oh, me? Yeah. Did I say it? Well, so what going sideways i lost the antecedent no no i was asking nate oh, nate. oh okay. Oh, okay oh oh i just i just don't even see i'm saying i'm saying it's it, to me it's a nonsense statement like sure. it's like it's like okay so what <clears throat> what is god what do you think god is if you're saying start with god i'm saying okay what does that mean what do you mean by well, god? right and even and even, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can still hear yeah. you. 
Okay, so this is, I'll bring up this quote again, because I love to bring this up to people um, who are within this uh, culture and tribe. And because I, and I think it's true. It's really wonderful. I'm sorry if I can find it really quickly. Um, Because, okay, here we go. So without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But as these are connected by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. And that is a quote by John Calvin. So, right. Okay. That's fine. So, but, but. What does he mean by that? Like, you know, like what is, when he says you can't know God unless you know yourself, what does knowing yourself mean to him? Well, right. I think he's acknowledging is that that seeing yourself something that's as, true. Seeing yourself as a filthy rag. And then when you see yourself as the filthy rag, then you understand God better as, as being, you know, someone who doesn't see you actually anymore but as see, a see this is well it's where the theology like it's the systems i mean this probably goes back to like our render unto caesar talk and i think this is fundamentally true with, within our what we called our non-utopian christian anarchism is christianity is fun time, fundamentally relational it's yes. not a system and so when you, when you want to make something a system, so like take systematic theology and have this completely mapped left brain theology, this is where Calvinism falls to bits, I think, is because even though it has a lot of good points and a lot of good intuitions, like theoretically, it is a system of a bunch of parts that fit into a whole, but they don't work. So when you start asking questions like this, I, this is where I genuinely, like I'm not, this isn't a rhetorical gotcha question. When I when I was having that conversation with Cal and Michael, I really know. I want to know. I want to talk to a to like a philosophically trained Calvinist and just mm-hmm. be like, "What is a man in a mm-hmm. Calvinist frame? What what are they?" I don't think that they have a a good way to explain unity and multiplicity. I don't think they do. Right? Because, because if, if like, it, there's no okay. Look, okay. Here's the thing. This is why I kept asking, like, what is God then, right? Because God, uh, to to use to to use the classical phrase, is a relational substance. God already, like, God's being is involved is involved in the very concept of relation, yeah. and we are created in the image of God. You are also a fundamentally relational being. So when you ask that question that Harding starts with, what am I? If you are just, if you, if you, if you honestly go within the self to find the answer, if you, if you do that, you find out when you, when you get to your ultimate substratum, that ultimate substratum is ultimately nothing, right? That you are ultimately just empty space. And you only come into being by being in relation with something. We make space for one another. Our existence is inherently relational. It is the relations that actually um, are most fundamental, which is which Neil Gilchrist is going to get to like later in a segment that we haven't played here. And that's fundamentally right. But that's not, I mean, that's like, that goes that goes all the way back to like the very earliest parts of like the Christian Neoplatonic tradition. Like Augustine is pointing at that. Why is that? How is it that as fundamental as that relation? Do they just like read all of uh, Augustine, but but not De Musica? Like how is it the Calvinist theology loses that fundamental importance of relationality? Or maybe well, it does have it. Back to- no, to bring it back to McGilchrist, it's because, and to the very first clip we played about subjectivity and vision and salience, and, 
and that we all fundamentally see different worlds because we all are individual persons that have individual values and what we value springs forth. And so that's what we see while other people see other things. And so when that happens, but this is what happens within the, within the Calvinist thing is they will read all of Augustine, but they will only see the things that purport to their map. Because the left hemisphere, what it yes. doesn't see, doesn't exist. Right. Yes. And, and, exist. and because they're fundamentally, but like, this is not, this isn't something, this isn't something to, so to let the Calvinists off the hook a little bit. This isn't something that is just unique to Calvinism. It's, no. it's unique to neoconservatives no. No. and neoliberals and woke people and trans any activists. Sy any system. And, any, system. Yes. Any, any ideological position, really. Yes. Yeah. Which, right. which is why, fundamentally which is not. why, which is why, okay. So which is, this is why John Verveke's project cracks me up because like, if you really like, if you are thinking about Christianity in proper terms, Christianity is already the religion that is not a religion but because what Christianity yes. is, is a call <laughs> into a mode of being right. that is radical relationality. That's what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in as much as you are living into that mode of being, you are Christian. And in as much as you are not living into that mode of being, you are not Christian. Yeah. He who does by the law without the law, what the law prescribes is fine. I think St. Paul said that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Jess, yeah. Jess, what do you think? You haven't spoken forever because all of us excitable people are. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. I, man, there's something about this conversation that just tires me man i'm yeah. just like <laughs> like i like throughout like like my my growing up was like evangelical protestant but it was more on the charismatic side of things rather than yeah and i had zero interest in any of this stuff like to learn it to, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> like okay. i i don't I really don't care about what John Calvin said or the reformers. Like I don't have any interest in it. <laughs> I don't have any interest in it at all. Other than like, you, you know, other than, I don't know. It, it wears me out. <laughs> like you can you know play what? back the video. I probably yawned like five times. <laughs> <laughs> no you know i understand I, think, I actually okay I'm, so jess i I, raised, yeah. I I was raised pentecostal and i had i feel exactly <laughs> exactly exactly the same way and like it, to, there's a lot of frustration for me in, in in this conversation too because it's just like it's very very hard like when someone just doesn't see like how harmful something is like how do you even like how do you communicate that like what well can you I, do? Yes. I think it's, here's it, like sherry was hit in at the point again was like the left brain doesn't know what it doesn't know right how do you get the right brain's attention well well, well yes. if the left brain's focused you you can't necessarily divert the focus so so you do it through the you know maybe childlikeness you do it through mm -hmm. uh, surprise you do it through something unexpected you do it through um even even something like um like creativity creativity <laughs> shocking someone like that that will that will get them to divert their attention and if if you can be like how does this fit in your frame and then if <laughs> and then you you they have to it, but this natu this naturally happens if you have too tight of a system something will happen in your life that will do that so it's not necessarily yeah. something that we have right. to do, but, but it, it's interesting to think about in having these kind of conversations, if you get locked tight into a systematic conversation with someone to try to be playful and try to, right. yes. try yes. to tell a story yes. about some time when I was in awe and wonder, because, because then, then you're just like, you're not playing the game anymore. And, and Here, so you're just like, and this is, yeah, yes, this is why this is why that's so important is because the, all those things, playfulness, humor, childlikeness. Um, childlikeness, all of that, those are modes of being that are relational. Mm -hmm. They're not just propositional. They have 
they they are mosaic. They, there's many many things going on in playfulness and humor. There it is. Well, you know, okay. I will say, I, I, I will and give so, you one. So, but like, I'll tell you what. I have one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. One more thing is so so this this is what I would argue. This is the this is the problem. Is I think it's really easy for us because we are Western to want to cast out Satan by Satan. So we'll want to point out the logical absurdity of Calvinism and why it doesn't work propositionally and logically and and they will not hear that we well, no just one's said ever the, no their one's left ever. brain will not hear it no one's ever and so what you have to you have to love them you have to play with them they have to trust you the only way they will see it is through relationality and trust that's yeah, the only way they, i will anything i'm wrong about that's the only way i'll see it yeah and 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 there's that's, a way in which their right brain is satisfied somehow with the completeness of their system and so by disturbing it you're you're uh you know systems are beautiful in a way if you if you have a complex and this is this is the trap that very intelligent people get into is is that you'll they'll systematize things down to the point where it all seems to work Mm -hmm. there's you know even there's no paradox yeah, there's no there's no paradox, and, and where do you get surprised? Where's the awe and wonder? Where's the childlikeness anymore? And the, like, you, th- there is a beauty in a system that works tightly and and fit everything fits, but but it doesn't provide a place to live in. <laughs> right, <laughs> nothing can live inside of it. Right, and and what we're really looking for is a space actually more than to live to be and become and and a tightly grouped system like where do you grow you reach the edges of it well it's an egg you've got to break that open and then you you become a chicken or whatever <laughs> <laughs> like you, were, like you were saying Cass, earlier that, that that you find this kind of conversation boring well not uh, the conversation just the well no i mean that's the, the yeah, talk- yeah. The topic. I think right? he meant he finds me boring. That's what he meant. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. Well, I mean, I, I get it because, you know, if you didn't grow up, and that's almost an oxymoron because you can't yeah. really grow in this kind of environment, okay? Then, so I can say, I know that I know from, from what Luke said earlier that, that this is a concern of his. I know that it's a concern of mine. I know that it's a concern of Douglas Harding's. We're all asking the same question. Mm-hmm. Who, who am I? What am I? Mm-hmm. What am, what is man? Okay. And why do we ask that question? Because we don't, in that kind of tight system that you were talking about, we never, there was no opportunity to become. And as a, as a living organism, spiritually and physically, that's what you're doing. You're becoming something, right? Yeah. So you're kind of, you're totally constrained in this, in this place, in this theology and, and, and you underdevelop right. in a sense you do, well, you underdevelop. And as, and as much because, it, because as long as you're in, as much as you are trying to grasp and apprehend and seize that identity for yourself, it won't be real no, because it's not. it has to, because it has to be received as gift. And it's ultimately a gift that it's a, it's a gift that we receive from one another and from God. It's a gift that is received in relation. That's and you where don't deserve it. And you, and you don't, don't right, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. But the relation <laughs> is more fun. To, but the, but the relation is, but, but yes, but it's, it's not deserved because it's a gift. That's the nature of gift. It's not, not deserved because you're a piece of shit. Far from that. If you if you refer to yourself as a piece of shit, you are you are in as far as I'm concerned, that is a denial of God. Yeah. Because God is love. God is a relational substance. Well, he made you. you. Right. <laughs> and you are denying the very nature of God in making that move. Mm-hmm. It is actually the most atheistic thing you can do. So hmm. I, you know, and then just talked about playfulness and humor and childlikeness. And um there's a quote, a George MacDonald quote, um, and he uses the verse where Jesus takes the child on his knee and says, except you be like a little child, right? Right. Um, and, and, and it's because there's a conversation happening beforehand 
with the disciples about winners and losers. Right. Winners and losers, okay? Yeah. And that's that dualistic <laughs> thing that McGilchrist talks about, right? right. Of, 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 this, of this dualism that we have to contend with all the time. And Jesus takes the child, which represents playfulness and innocence and lack of culpability, lack of culpability, let me say that again, okay? And he puts the child on his knee and he, and he does a chalk and awe campaign. Okay. Right. That's what he's doing. Yeah. And, and McDonald says this, and I just want to read this as a short quote. Go for it. He who receives a child then in the name of Jesus does so perceiving wherein Jesus and the child are one. What is common to them? He must not only see the ideal child in the child he receives, that reality of loveliness, which constitutes true childhood, but he must perceive that the child is like Jesus, or rather that the Lord is like the child and may be embraced, yea, is embraced by every heart childlike enough to embrace a child for the sake of his childness. I do not therefore say that none but those who are thus conscious in the act partake of the blessing, but a special sense, a lofty knowledge of blessedness belongs to the act of embracing a child as the visible likeness of the Lord himself. For the blessedness is the perceiving of the truth. The blessing is the truth itself, the God known truth that the Lord has the heart of a child. The man who perceives this knows in himself that he is blessed, blessed because it is true. And, yeah, you know, I, and, and, I love that, Sherry. Yeah. And McDonald was a Presbyterian. So <laughs> just in case you think we're picking, we're picking on reform people in general. Yeah, he was, was not an Orthodox Christian. Or a <laughs> mcdonald i mean mcdonald wasn't a calvinist well, but, but, but when you're talking but here's the thing though it's like here's the thing and and you know david bentley hart is orthodox and he refers to mcdonald as saint george mcdonald yes like and that's the thing is like when you're talking about the real thing about living into that radical relationality the denominational barriers don't mean Doesn't, anything anymore no. it's just oh that's a real christian i guess and, and, we, and you know what we all know that too we know it when we see it like and and it doesn't yeah. matter it doesn't matter what like tradition that person identifies with at all because we know it when we see it yeah it's the just right, the name. and it's the that's right the... brain that knows it it's not the left right. brain that's and this the... is why, yeah oh, go ahead. well i was just gonna say that's that robert Irwin quote that i love all the time is seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees like when the Christian isn't a, like all the denominational lines disappear when you're, when you're seeing it truly, because it's, and it's not. And then again, like, this is where a dualist will say like, Oh, like Luke's saying, it doesn't matter if you're Orthodox. That's not what I'm saying. Like get out of your dualistic frame of thinking. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying everyone who is a Christian is one and your category, your label, your thing that you want to put on that in your left brain thing isn't ultimate. And so do I think, and that doesn't mean, and Sam said this to me the other day, like he said that that's just punting to some kind of like spiritual church that is unvisible, that is invisible and behind and unveiled and stuff. I'm saying, no, the, the church is physical. It's the Orthodox church. There it is. But like, but that doesn't mean that like, it is just that thing. Like, what is that phrase that Dave always says is like, we know who it's some like famous orthodox quote it's something mm -hmm. like yeah we know who um we know who is in the church we don't know who is not no what is it i don't know i can't think of it right but essentially it's like yeah i'm not a i'm not a i'm really not evangelical in this sense anymore that i'm a like conversionist i don't think that I don't think to be a Christian is to think about things the same way as me. I don't think that it's to adopt the titles that I adopt. I don't, again, it's not identitarianism. It's not replicas. I, I don't think being a Christian is being just like identical machine replicas of each other. 
I yeah, think well, it is being your well, own I, I, I would, personal version right. within a unity. Well, I it's would multiplicity say this, and unity. If our focus is on participation and relation, when we are relating and participating, it is it is all the same God that we're relating and participating with. Like I would, I, yeah. I I I would say that like when when, Chris, when Christians aren't are let, let, let's say when Christians are not engaged in radical radical or, or uh, in logical argument with one another, and di disputing about propositions. Yeah. Let's say you have a you have a group of Christians and they're all they're all singing in church. They're all singing to the same God. So they're all participating in the same God. Like there's in, in that moment where you're just like in the hymn, yeah. and you're singing and you're worshiping. Everyone is worshiping the same thing because there's because there is only one God yeah, <laughs> to be like, in relation say, say, with and to participate right. with. Yeah, say but at the same time, that no. Gnostic hymn, I'll fly away. At the same time, <laughs> to get back they're to still it. participating in the same God, though. Sorry, Sherry, Whether I made a joke. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the McGilchrist thing, you know, at the very beginning, he talks about um, we create we're we're creating the world through attention. Right. Yeah. And 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 then I referenced John Verbeke's Luther episode. Um, that is a world created through attention. That's what that is. That's right. what he demonstrates. He shows how we withdrew ourselves from God because our attention was misdirected. Right. And that attention, um, you know, this question of what is man? Right. Even the psalmist asks, who is man that thou art mindful of him? Right. He, he wants he has that same he has that same question. Who am I to you know, where do I why am I important? Because you know what? We know that we are important. We know that we're valuable. We know that we have a role to play. And 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 it's that is the thing that we need to walk into. Right. That and when you are living in a system that that constrains you from moving forward in that and answering that question who am i and what role do i have to play then you then go, then you withdraw yourself from god right that's what you do well yeah well the, the modes i would say and luke will like this because i would say that the modes of attention that are available to you are ultimately mammon or communion it's like you're either you're either you're you're either attending to things as mere objects or you're you're or you're attending to things as subjects with which you are in communion. Yeah, the only the only choices are Christ and Antichrist, and even the choice of Antichrist is a non-choice choice that is fading away because it so has I'm right, a universal because it ultimately has no being. <laughs> it's a perpetual right. bony. It's not real. You, act, you actually, yeah, you actually can't even choose that. So eventually, like that, just I mean, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so shall we move along to the uh, to the next segment? Okay. I got to yeah. get going. You guys okay. do that. I have to go to. All right. Well, Sorry. we'll just wrap it but up. We we'll just call this. We'll just call this part one and maybe we'll do uh, part two. Maybe do part two. Yeah, let's do part two. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, yeah, for, for joining me. Yeah, I knew this was going to be like, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> we didn't even get through even close. To, so maybe Michael will be able to join us next time. Yeah. All right. He was it's all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Great conversation, Bye. guys. Take yeah. care. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nate. Yep.